It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Ashley Esketha is here from CNET. First time since her baby was born. Denise Howell is here. And from Bloomberg, their tech editor, Nate Langson. We've got lots to talk about, including the confusion in Iowa. The NYPD dropping their notebooks for an iPhone app. GeForce now. Hue light bulbs and deep fakes, deep fakes on the internet. It's all coming up next on Twit. This Week in Tech comes to you from our Twit LastPass studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 757, recorded Sunday, February 9th, 2020. My fridge killed my Apple TV. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Casper. Casper is a sleep brand that makes expertly designed products to help you get your best rest, one night at a time. Get $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twit1 and using the promo code twit1 at checkout. And by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. Get the plan shipped to your door free at mintmobile.com slash twit. And by Epson's EcoTank printers. Now you can kiss expensive cartridges goodbye. The Epson EcoTank printer comes with a ridiculous amount of ink. Just fill and chill. Check out EcoTank printers at Epson.com slash EcoTank Leo. And by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. LinkedIn can help you speak to the right professionals at the right time. Right now, get a free $100 LinkedIn ad credit to launch your first campaign. Just visit LinkedIn.com slash twit. It's time for Twit, the show where we cover the week's tech news with a panel of esteemed journalists welcoming back Nate Langson, a tech editor for Bloomberg. He's out of London where tropical storm Ciara is, is bringing 80 mile an hour winds and 100 degree temperatures to the Emerald Isle. No, it's not that warm, I would guess, Nate. It is, it is not that warm, although I, I'll be honest, I haven't been outside at all today. Things are falling over. Things are flying through the air. The cat took one look outside and was like, just noped his <laughs> nope, way out of there. Not going out there. Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah, you said yeah. your wife's greenhouse got creamed. <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, this morning, I, we, I was just making breakfast, making coffee, and I pointed out to the window and I said, Kate, your greenhouse has, oh. appears to have moved. And uh, yeah, it's it's on its side at the moment. There was no point doing anything with it until the storm comes down. So it's just outside. It's the neighbor's problem now. <laughs> it is, as is the fence, which is also blown down on one side of the house. Oh, gosh. Well, well stay yeah. inside. Stay dry. Stay warm. I know it's the middle of the night, but I appreciate your staying up late with us. Also with us, Denise Howell, uh, longtime host of This Week in Law and Triangulation, both of which have now been canceled. So... I'm sorry, Denise. I'm, I'm glad you at least come back on Twit for me. <laughs> of course. I mean, I hope I'm not a bad lecturer. <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> it's Twit It's, Twitter it's me. Believe me, it's me. <laughs> Denise Howell is at DeniseHowell.info. That's a nice place. Oh, yeah. Do you still do the blogs and bag bags and bloggage, whatever? <laughs> Bag and Baggage was my blog a long time ago. I was one of the very first lawyers in the uh, world, I think, yeah. that had a web blog. Uh, and that was in the early 2000s. Wow. And no, Bag and Baggage retired a long time ago. Oh, but, um, I, you know, it's out there on the interwebs that. if I anyone's interested. Yeah, actually now uh, some Bag and Baggage store has, has the URL. Probably, <laughs> They're, yeah. they're selling there bags, <laughs> <laughs> literally. So yeah. there, you, there you go. Great to have yes. you, Denise. And boy, we got to welcome Ashley Esketha back to our microphones. It's been a little bit of a time. So she's been busy. I believe there is a child involved. I somehow someone allowed me to have a child. Um, yeah, they let me take it right out of the hospital. It was amazing. I, I'm a human <laughs> 3D printer. I made a person inside me. It's incredible. Yay! Congratulations. That's so great. Little Wolfgang is now, you said, seven months old? Yeah, he's, uh, he's almost eight months old. So it's he's been a little long bottom time. Teepees. Oh, he's got teeth. 
Uh, it's close to crawling. It's he's, but he's cool. He's That's like, uh, it's, it's weird. It's like a little computer. You see him downloading everything all the time. It's amazing. I, I know you're a senior producer. Did Cena, did, were you able to take some time off? Yeah, we, you know, I, I got to give credit where it's due. Um, CBS Interactive has like a very generous uh, family leave policy. So I was off for, I think, about four months. It's pretty good. That's great. Uh, and I gave you nine months. So I'm even more generous. I know. I know. I'd like, <laughs> I was so tired for a while, and I was just like, "I'm sorry, Carson. I just have no I energy. Can't I can't. It. I just can't live." And then, and then at the end, oh my god, I did E3 nine and a half months pregnant. Oh my god, that might have been a mistake. Oh my god. Uh, but it, I like my feet looked like bread loaves. It was just they were oh so swollen. My god. Um, but uh, but yeah, like and then like two weeks after that, I had uh, my son, and so. It was a, it was a, it was a long nine months, but fortunately, like, you know, I, I can't complain. No complications. It was very, uh, my, my doctor said it was a very boring pregnancy, which is a Perfect. good thing. So boring good. is good in this context. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it, it's hard to believe that the Iowa caucus was less than a week ago. Ugh. <laughs> uh, but honestly, that might be the big tech story of the week is the reliance of the Iowa Democratic Party upon an app which had little testing, less training, and in fact failed on the night of the caucus to the point where they really didn't get great results until just a few days ago. Uh, Charlie Wartzel's uh, quote, I think, in the New York Times was apt. Shadow, Shadow, which is the company that made the app, Shadow's Iowa failure was a dangerous combination of techno-utopianism and laziness, which led to slapdash software engineering, procurement, and deployment, blaming everybody involved, particularly, I think, uh, actually, this is not the story. I clicked the, the wrong link here. But this is, but particularly uh, the Iowa Democratic Party for rolling out an app that it just, it, it's funny, it's a combination of both techno-utopianism thinking, well, Technology is going to solve this and make this perfect and and fear that it would get hacked to the point where they didn't want to show anybody. And of course, as a result, the app didn't get vetted, didn't get checked, didn't get trialed, and, and nobody got any training in it. You couldn't have a worse failure. Nate, you're, you're watching this from abroad. Are you laughing at, uh, at uh, America right now? Uh no, I, no uh, not at all. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how much of this story made it over here. Oh, interesting. Um, it's it was news to me when I saw it in the rundown today. My um, the only point of comparison I had is that when the uh, our conservative party here about a year, maybe two years ago, um, had an event. It had an app that um, that could be used, and uh, all the 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 Tory politicians' details were basically accidentally made available to the public through it, um, which was a pretty terrible uh, little blooper. I don't know if that's the same thing that's going on here. but Well, and, and in a way, uh, I, th I find that interesting that you, there wasn't any coverage. It must seem puzzling yeah. to every other country that our presidential elections, which I think are fairly important to every other country, begin with the strangest ritual in high school gymnasiums in the state of Iowa called a caucus. Um, Denise, you must have looked at this. I mean, you're at least <laughs> following this in the U.S. And, and thought this is as bad as it can get. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to pretend I understand the whole caucus system. I, I don't oh, live in Idaho, Iowa and never have. Uh, but just the fact that um, an app was used to count votes is indicative of how Wild West the relationship of technology with U.S. elections remains. Um, you know, the electronic voting systems are, are certainly not ironclad by any means. And in fact, you know, it's it's, it's sport at hacker conferences to set up voting right. arenas where <laughs> right. you show exactly how many ways you can penetrate the electronic voting systems. So, um I wasn't surprised at all about this, but uh, I was probably in a minority. I think a lot of people think that that we can actually um, use technology to manage our elections, and we're far from it. You know, as you, as you point out, hackers have for a long time uh, pointed out, as security experts, that uh, electronic voting is risky. Uh, apps is even riskier. Internet voting is riskiest still. But one thing that everybody agrees on, Ed Felton talked about this. He's the Princeton professor who was, who was one of the first to 
with his team to crack uh, voting machines. I think it was the Diebold voting machines. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, at least in Iowa there was a paper trail. Uh, and that's what took so long. They had written votes from every caucus goer, and they were able to tally them. So they were able to get a, a, a decent tally. But I wish the New York Times had an article uh, later in the week, uh, a couple of days ago, where they said that even the results we're getting from Iowa now are inconsistent and crazy. They're clearly, you look at them, they're wrong. They don't pass a, a sanity check. So you can't even really blame the app at this point. you got to blame the process. And it's kind of embarrassing for a party that says we want, of course, the president and uh, the Republicans immediately jumped on it saying they can't run a caucus. How are they going to run the country? Yeah, I think this um, it's really interesting if you look at what Estonia has been doing for quite a while. They're with very digital. I think, yeah, I think it was it was as far back as maybe 2005, 2006, something like that, that, that they was the uh, citizens were able to vote online um they still do it i don't know if the majority do but i think it's pretty much law that you um that, that everyone has to be able to and you know everyone has these digital identity cards and i think there's like a little reader thing that you you insert it at your computer log in and cast your vote and it's it's all done like that um and uh, a lot of people roll Estonia out as being an example of, of how things could be done. But it's been doing it for so many years now that I kind of think, yeah, maybe that is how we should be doing it. Well, but Nate, I got to point out, uh, you may remember that the Estonian digital identity <laughs> card had a crypto flaw and had to it be did. reissued last year. <laughs> <laughs> right. And doing that for 300 million yeah. or however many voting Americans we have is yeah. really difficult. And at, well, and I think this goes back to, I mean, like we talked about this previously, Leo, like it comes back to this, uh, you know, lack of an ethical reckoning in software development where, you know, we have these people who say, I can solve this problem that, you know, ha is, is right now very analog and I can make an app like Facebook to bring people together or whatever it is without them really truly considering the ethical ramifications of worst case use scenarios and bad actors and, you know, how it can be weaponized against its its own actual user base. And so this is the same problem, right? So it's it's something that they said, oh, well, we can do this and we can, you know, make the caucus easier for you to report all your results um, without really thinking about worst case scenarios here. I mean, you know, and and that it also speaks to the fact that the phone lines were so jammed. I mean, expect be prepared and expect for that app to not work. And well, that's exactly what happened. Some... They had a manual that they'd used for years, manual reporting method with the phone. And right. they were so bullish about this app that they but said, they... we're going to make yeah. those lines be the tech support lines for the app. <laughs> yeah, not good. So when the app failed, the lines got jammed and then people couldn't manually report. They were on hold for hours yeah, it was. It was he actually that guy on Wolf Blitzer who yeah. was on hold yeah. and complaining about it to Wolf Blitzer, and then he kept saying, "I have to go" because they're they picked up and then they hung up on him, and he had to start the <laughs> process all over again. It was so bad. It was so bad. Oh. What's great is it's something anybody can who's ever used tech can completely identify with the long hold on a tech support line and then getting hung up on. Your call's important to us. Your number five thousand seventy two. In Leo, that literally happened to me last week with the Motorola Razor. I called asking where is my phone because I had ordered it to do an unboxing on launch day. And they were like, we let us call you back. And I'm like, they're like, we'll call you right back in, in within five minutes. I'm like, great. And I had had like five cups of coffee that morning. Oh boy. And I really had to pee. Oh, and boy. 35 minutes later, I was like, I'm going to die. And so I went to the bathroom and came <laughs> and back. Called. And sure enough, they called me. I was like, well, I give up. I give that up. means they have cameras in the house, Ashley. I just want to see. Ugh. Is she in the bathroom yet? Okay, call now. Call now. Call this now. is even worse because it's tech support combined with a state agency, right? So, oh, so bad. I mean, talk about a it's collision of get. miserable situations. I don't know if you've tried to make an appointment at the California DMV recently, oh, but that's an hour on the phone at oh, least. Oh, my God. It's the worst. Yeah. You don't do but it online? And, and, you try to well, call you them, but it, it doesn't work. Oh. But it's, yeah, it's yeah. it's very hit or miss. Very hit or miss. And, well, and, and like Leo, you were just saying, you know, the Republicans and the GOP, you know, like Trump and everybody's like, oh, like they, how are they going to run a country? They can't even run this caucus. Really, I mean, the the really bad thing was all of the disinformation that was getting 
put out there while they were trying to figure out what was going on. People are like, oh, it's rigged. It's, you know, people's nerves are so on edge right. that when even the slightest thing goes wrong in this election year, like people immediately go to those conspiracy theories. They immediately start spreading, you know, well, what if this happened? Right. And it's, it's just really dangerous. It's so scary. Well, we won't know. And I saw, I still seen on Reddit, oh, th this was a hack and, you know, all sorts of conspiracy right. theories. Uh, and I guess we, you know, who knows? And and you, you've learned, if we've learned nothing from, from the last few years, it's to expect that. Uh, to, right. to, I mean, the but lesson of 2019. That. That's the problem. I know. The lesson of 2019 was techno utopianism is dead. Yeah. <laughs> and yet right. uh, people are still looking well, to that, technology for solutions. That's the that great Atlantic article. article. The, the disinformation, disinformation is going to be the crux of this year's that just, and, and for every future election that we have. <sighs> I, you know what the I, problem with Iowa, aside from just the intricacies of its caucus system, which I, you know, I'm sure that it has its benefits and there are reasons why well, Iowa. It's, it's old form uh, democracy. You and your neighbors right. get together, right? It's like a Chautauqua or something. But the thing is, they go first, and there's all this the sort of national significance associated with it that the person who wins in Iowa often goes on to become the nominee. Right. And since we don't know who won, or if we do, it's it's you know subject to question. Um, it's it's difficult. I, I, here in California, we moved up our uh, primary. Uh, we used to go late, so we would have no impact. Now we're March third. Yep. And my my ballot, my vote by mail ballot, actually arrived. I think it was yesterday. I, I already it voted. Too. Yeah. I already yeah. filled it out. Yep. Uh, I saw Ashley. I saw that headline. And uh, I declined to read it because I thought I'm already depressed. It's really scary. And, you know, I shared it with I shared it on Facebook specifically to get it to people who are affected by things like that every single day on social media. Uh, the premise is get ready because this ain't nothing. And uh, right. we're going to be in a nine month cycle of m mystery, disinformation, propaganda, lies, truths and and of course, the uh, end result of all of that is that everybody just throws up their hands and says, I give up. Right. It's it's obfuscation. And that's, that's that the goal. Is, that's the goal of disinformation. It's not to convince you that something isn't true. It's to make you question the thing that is true. And that's that's the only goal. And it's you know, it's it's really scary because there are lots of people out there who are not, uh, you know, I, I've seen even my my very media savvy friends fall victim to this where they'll share something and I'm like this has been debunked like please stop posting this like this please don't use this place as a source you know and it, it, it captures almost everyone at some point you know and it's it's just it's really uh man it's it's going to be a, a very wild uh election year this year is there Do you a feel like, is, though, that people are beginning to distrust getting their information from social media? God, I mean, I, hope I, so. I think yeah. younger generations are. But I, I mean, are they? I, my parents are they? They, are get, they don't get it from Facebook to get anymore. Their news on Facebook, my, they, my parents, uh, my friends' parents. I mean, they all get their news on Facebook. Well, so the you young, the youngs get it from Instagram from, or from Snapchat or and, TikTok. And they're, and that's, that's even all worse. now getting permeated with this information as well. Yeah. It's just, it's all, it's really bad. And and I think, um, I think at some point there's going to have to be, I mean, we see it in pockets and I think it's a really good idea. I mean, when I went to college for broadcast journalism, I had to take classes that were literally critical thinking in mass media. And it was uh, how to spot propaganda, how to, how to, uh, how to fact check things, how to do. And I think, regardless of whether you're a journalism student or not, because the news is all around us in every single thing we do because it's always connected. Um, I, I think our education system has to change to to teach people otherwise. And well, that's so, not going to fix anything in 2020. What, no, <laughs> what no, we, of course not. But it's, so, it, that's the fundamental crux of the problem. Maybe that, in 2030, you know, we, but for, for the true, next year, we're going to... Probably farther than that. Yeah. So, so what do you, so what do we do? Denise, do you have, what, what's your prescription? Is there anything we could do in the next nine months to avoid this kind of information overload? Um, I think having conversations like the one we're having right now and having them, you know, with our friends and family and, and people that we come into contact with are, is really important. I, I, my personal anecdotal sense is I do feel like my 
my group of folks around me are are very distrustful of information that they get on social media, Good. and I'm grateful for it. And I do but I do think does it's that leave a void? Doesn't that leave a void? Like if you're not getting, so where are they getting information from? Um, hopefully from actual journalists. <laughs> and where would we find those? Ah, well, I guess that's subject to debate as well. I mean, but, the pollution you know. continues up the chain, food chain. Yeah. Uh, if you, it, I mean, the problem with 24-hour news channels is they have to obsess. They have to entertain. <laughs> they have right. to entertain. They have to keep, they, and, they, and so I was talking to my wife the other day. She said, I can't watch it because it's the same story over and over again. Isn't anything else happening? And you don't get the sense that anything else is happening. By the way, I, I hear I Brexit happened. Nate, did that happen? It did. I heard that. Yeah. You I'm afraid to say so. <laughs> Eventually it did. It did take place. Is there place. a similar issue in uh, in Great Britain with, uh, I think there is, with disinformation? It, do, I don't, yeah. for some reason I feel like somebody living on Stoughton on the Thames is not reading Facebook as, as much as the people in Iowa are. Or is that not the case? If there I mean, is I such a town. Are, yeah, I mean, pe 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 people, people, are, people are reading the news here. I think the, part of the problem that we had with, with Brexit and online is that people discounted the older vote. Um, they, I think people expected more young people to, uh, to come out and to register and to vote. And they probably did, um, just not enough of them. And as you were saying, you know, where are younger people getting their news from? From what I hear, not being massively young anymore, unfortunately, is that a, a huge number of people are getting news and getting their awarenesses broadened from the these influences, you know, whether it's on YouTube, on Snapchat or TikTok, you know, they have an incredible power over not only what young people hear, but I think also what young people discuss with each other. Um, I think one of the positives of Brexit, and it is only it's a silver lining rather than anything else, I suppose, is that I think a lot of younger people have now been empowered to make a change in the future. Um, and hopefully that will be the case. But until then, I think we've just got to basically keep fighting these um, the, the disinformation fires as we've been talking about so far. Nate, do you, Nate, do you have you ever heard? Um, I forget the uh, survey or the, the study that was done, it was a while ago. Um, it was about Gen Z and even a little bit younger than that, um, asking sort of how they felt or how they found news. And the majority of respondents said, if the news is big enough, it will find me. They don't actually go looking for news. They wait for it to hit them. Um, and I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. I think that is absolutely completely believable. I think the the caveat to that is that through what filter is the news reaching them? Because a right, lot of right, first of impressions, course. I think, you know, make a huge difference. Um, and that I think that's where a lot of the confusion sometimes come comes from. I think it's why social media companies have had such an important role to play in fighting, uh, even, you know, even just misinformation, because a lot of people will just see and share based on headlines alone, as we know. And I think if that initial headline is not necessarily conveying the big news in the fairest or most balanced way or what have you, then you're getting, um, you know, that's just, that's, that's spreading. But I can totally believe it. Yeah. Although I haven't seen that particular study. I also wonder if we, th so you can say, oh, well, pay attention to the news and good, do good sources and blah, 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 or only look for the news when it comes to you. But it isn't the only, the, the, that's not the only source of misinformation and propaganda, that a lot of it is subtle. If you watch TikTok or influencers, they're not giving you news right. stories, but they are mm. influencing your way of thinking in a subtle, <clears throat> less detectable way, and a way, in a way that is more difficult to defend against. Does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we're we're actually generating a culture uh, through uh, unconsciously through these tools like TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and Facebook that, and we're not we don't really know what we're getting. Look right, at this, Mike Mike Bloomberg yeah. paying influencers to make him seem cool. This really terrifies me. Uh, because I mean, th there's a gap. There's there's exactly what you're talking about. Um, a lot of, particularly younger folks, get their information through their 
social media feeds, they're skeptical about it and they have a rubric for judging right. whether something is an ad or not. And that's whether they're seeing hashtag ad on that post. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there is this gray area where campaigns working with influencers uh, recognize how important it is. And if you read that Daily Beast piece about uh, Bloomberg, that he's targeting, they point out the irony that he's got the biggest war chest of uh, really um, any or many of the candidates. And he is targeting these micro, micro influencers, you know, people with a thousand or 5,000 follow followers. And he's using an app called Tribe, which um, is how those people find uh, sponsors for it's their kind of, sponsors. It's an agency for influencers. Right, exactly. But it's not the it's not just the Kim Kardashians of the world. They have no, their own no. they have their people. This is no, for little influencers. It's is something that's going to look more organic. Right. But, you know, get behind our pay, they're going to pay $150 a post and uh you know, how the and whether that payment is disclosed seems very fuzzy. Uh and um there's actually a journalist over at the Morning Consult Sam, oh, I'm forgetting Sam's last name, uh, who wrote about this back in uh, the latter part of last year, uh, Sam Sabin. And uh, she reached out to the Federal Election Commission and said, you know, what's going on with this? We, Of course, we're going to see candidates reaching out to influencers and wanting to get them on board and wanting to pay them for posts. Uh, what do you think about that? And the FEC did not get back to the morning consult or Sam Saban. They have so, no I mean, way they're to. They're like, what is Instagram? They have no yeah. way, no way to regulate it. It's not, no. it's not an ad exactly. Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean. I think the FTC might beg to differ. Whenever you're being paid, paid. to mm -hmm. um, say a particular thing, even if you're coming up with the language for it, I think the FTC would judge it an ad. And I think the UK's equivalent. But does the uh, FTC have the enforcement capability to find all of this stuff and Well, they have the rules on the books. Whether they're going to go out and enforce is, is another story. But the rules are pretty toothy. Um, $15,000 per violation is is a good uh, disincentive for people who are, you know, trying to earn a hundred fifty dollars a post. Right. So they have they have enforced God, it a, uh, here in okay. in Britain. Mm -hmm. they, it, there have been people who have fallen foul of of not disclosing uh, either that something was sponsored or paid, um, and more worryingly, are promoting things with with alleged medical benefits. Often it's things like weight loss, uh, things along those lines, and they're not disclosing that actually whether these trials have been done or not, whether they've been done on a, a big enough sample. These things are not making their way through the messaging that an influencer is perhaps naively not even cognizant of needing to share with their audience. Um, but there's, there's definitely been fines issued here, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's not a, a unique case I, to Britain. I can't remember yeah. the numbers, but the FTC enforcement division is not, <laughs> let's, it's not replete with people. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not, not a robust, no. it's, it's, yeah, a robust agency. No, but it's not afraid to write letters and point out when when it you know has big public. I, I would suspect that they're focused more. Examples of something gone wrong. The fire festival comes to mind. Yeah, but they're going to be focused oh, yeah. more on you know drug yeah. campaigns and stuff than Mike Bloomberg hiring you know for 150 bucks some Instagrammer to say, hey, Mike's pretty cool. What right. a bargain! I mean, if Kim Kardashian charges. I don't know, two million dollars for a Instagram ad. I mean, that's that's over. That's like thirteen thousand. So micro is, influencers you could buy off for the same for the same amount of money. This right? is from the Daily Beast. Right. For a fixed one hundred fifty dollar fee through Tribe, the Bloomberg campaign is pitching micro influencers, someone who has from one to one hundred thousand followers, to create original content. Quote that tells us why Mike Bloomberg is the electable candidate who can rise above the fray, work across the aisle, so all Americans feel heard and respected. That's a subtle message. You know, I, I think mm. if we look back at the last few campaigns, uh, we, we can see this trend towards better and better, more and more effectively using the Internet for getting elected. Obama started with Facebook in uh, 2012, uh, Trump got very good at using Brad Parscale and his team figured out how to use Facebook. But I wouldn't be in, in 2016. I wouldn't be at all surprised if in 2020, 
the the winner is the one who can figure out how to inf use micro influencers. It yeah. gets it get and the thing is, and this was my point is, you may have a great defense against that headline that Grandpa shared on Facebook, but you might it's so subtle you might not have that kind of defense against some Instagram person publishing well, it's an opinion right it's, an it's opinion. like it's oh this is why i think he's a great candidate and, and, and don't like, we do this really as humans and like don't that. we do this as humans just think about like your movie picks aren't you heavily influenced what movie you go to see by what your friends said about it right yeah right. So, i think it's it's no different to elect a president i mean it's a, a different magnitude of importance but that doesn't mean we're going to treat it any differently right and i you, mean and you can really always say like oh you know, I, I don't care for this candidate. Here's why. But the thing is, is if someone likes them, like you're, you know, if someone's on board for somebody, you're a lot of times it's very hard to dissuade them regardless of what argument you can make, because it's it is very, you know, subjective. It's you know, it's has to do with people's personal opinions about stuff. I, I think it can't be a very far stretch for the FEC to say, look, if the FTC is going to expect you, if you're handed a pair of false eyelashes and you go on and you post about how great they are and you're expected to put hashtag ad on that, if you're being paid $150 by Michael Bloomberg, you're expected to put hashtag ad on that too. Uh, but we really need someone to come out and give that guidance because I think, you know, the people who ingest this material are used to those signposts helping them judge what it is they're looking at. And absent those signposts, they're going to think, oh, this is organic and real. Yeah. And you, uh, uh, so really, this is, the, this is the story. One of the things we've been talking about for the last two years a lot, probably ad nauseum, is this, this story of how uh, technology has, and social media have really weaponized these these kind of things and 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 given people tools that never existed before propaganda tools that never mm -hmm. existed before i always think about uh herman goebbels who uh uh in the third reich figured out that radio this brand new medium of radio would be a perfect propaganda tool and the nazis were very effective in using radio and uh and and now we have new tools and, new, and I don't think anybody would use radio. <laughs> All right. If you're going to go historical, I have to go historical and bring up Howard Dean, who was the first guy who used the Internet in a campaign. For fundraising and very effectively. Yep. Right. In 2004. Uh, Did he, Joseph Gibbs, He had the sorry, first campaign him. website. Yeah. Uh, it was, Did he really? Uh, how it was they the fundraised how, and had look, volunteer recruitment. Look how recent that was, though. Yeah. Right? That was, what, 10, 12 years changed. ago? Things change so rapidly. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it, we kind of absorbed smartphones, but really, uh, Obama was the first president to have a smartphone. Mm -hmm. I remember that was a big deal when he switched away from a BlackBerry. Yeah, that was it was like a that was a huge yeah thing. Whoa! And now it's going to be uh, Mike Bloomberg, the first president to use micro influencers. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! Uh, you said to you something interesting. You got my attention, Ashley. You have. The new Motorola Razor. Have you? Did you get it? Uh, no, no. I don't you know. You still don't have it. I still don't have it. I have a. I have a theory. Actually, I have a theory. So uh, they don't want you to have it because here's the thing. CNET did get one. It, it ended up in our Louisville office, which is pretty cool. At least we got one, and we actually put it in our. We have a folding machine, uh, and we put the Galaxy Fold in there a while back, and I think it was like 120 I, plus I thousand. I love it that CNET it has down. a folding machine. Oh yeah. We, we get serious about our about our folding screens. <laughs> and uh, we did a live stream uh, on on launch day last week where we put the razor to the test and we put it in that machine. And to be fair, it is not a machine that is calibrated in the same way. Like I'm curious as to what Motorola's process is. They did tweet at us and they're like, this is not calibrated the same way we test our phones and all well, that so stuff. What? That Humans yeah. are not calibrated right. machines. You're going to open it kind of weird yeah. anyway. So, but it, it is a very good folding machine. And so it made it uh, about 27,000 cycles. And then uh, they said, we got to stop. It's Let's definitely break it down. But yeah, that's our folding machine right there. And we just open <laughs> and close it. We do a big live stream. It just goes until it doesn't, until we feel it's not going to work anymore. 27,000 folds. That's a lot. It's a lot. But Although, it's not 120,000. I mean, the Galaxy Fold did... You know, I think it was 124,000 volts. Well, if you're, I mean, you're going to open and close it 10, 20 times a day. 
Right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's. And we're not, again, we're not perfectly calibrated machines. So, so I argue that this is like a, you know, it's a reasonable test. Like I said, it's not, it's not factory quality calibration, but you know, we do this cool, uh, we do this thing. It's like four hours long. So skip toward the end, but they did get one and, um, that's Lexi Savitas. Yep. She's. She's checking out the devices, showing off the old one, but there it is. Oh. Uh, we've got the timer. We've we got the whole up. thing. <laughs> we've got the whole thing going. And uh, no, that's in real. I think that's in real time. This is in real time, um, yeah. It's just fast. Yeah, we have it fold very well, I mean, that's 27, that, is, that is pretty quick. That yeah. is really quick. For, for that anyone is really quick. who's I listening just to the audio, it, there's something very zen about watching this folding let me, machine. Let me turn on the it audio. It is here. very yeah. weird. <laughs> can, you t can you turn up my it, audio? It, it, can you hear it? It, it looks a little bit like a robot learning how to applaud. Like to okay, clap. Yeah, close your eyes. Like it sounds like a spanking machine to me. I'm sorry. You might ask. Say, it's like a robot clap machine. Leo, how do you know what a spanking machine sounds like? <laughs> no, no one asked. <laughs> I just want to say that when I was at Yale, there was a secret society. Well, I'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> that is hysterical. So at 27,000... It just, uh, what happened? It, it just, I think they pulled it out of the machine because they were, uh, we don't, it we don't. started to smoke. We, as I said, we don't make it go until it's about like the batteries in danger or anything like that because we don't want to put anybody like in actual harm's way. Uh, so we, I believe there was a point where they said, okay, we got to call it. We got to, we got to pull this thing out. Well, and to, to be completely fair, now that people have this, a lot of them, people are saying it's not, it's falling apart in my hands. It's not I mean, great. Yeah. It's, you know, this is the inherent issue with new technologies, right? I mean, it's, it's cool to be an early adopter, but you also have to kind of accept that maybe you're not going to get the highest quality thing. You might just get a really cool futuristic thing that will be better and better every iteration after. It really does feel like the idea of a, of a screen that folds is it? Is it not? I want a tablet that folds, right? Where it's like I like an iPad mini that folds in half right. into a phone, like a, a iPhone Max on the back. Well, there, that that's, so there's that's two different approaches. One is that it's a normal size phone that becomes a tablet. The other is that it's a, ta a, a normal size fold that folds into like a pocket square Smaller, size. yeah, yeah. In See, fact, and that's uh, the flip. Was the, is it the... The flip, I yeah. think, is and it, there's a rumor. it looks like a little compact. It's real cute. Tuesday, um, Samsung's going to have an event in San Francisco. Yeah, that's, I and saw that's the rumor. That's there's the a one. rumor they're going to do that. And I think Huawei has one They've already that we've seen leaked uh, video of. Mm -hmm. But Samsung, yeah. it, it folds As, into a little... It looks like a little makeup compact. Like, so, that's the rumor. It's so going to be a little tiny That's square. an interesting question. Would you rather have a regular size phone that folds out to a tablet size... I think I wouldn't mind having like a little pocket phone that becomes normal. Yeah, I think a lot of people, like, I think a lot of people who don't have that power user case um, would probably enjoy having a smaller device. I mean, we see how many people still wish for the days of, you know, the iPhone SE. Like, oh, man, I really love the original size iPhone. It was the perfect size. And, um, and so, you know, there are those people out there. And I think a lot of casual users would be very happy to have a phone like that that folds up real small and slips into their pocket or, you know. Just a, a little clutch purse or something like that. I, I mean, I, I don't blame them. That would be cool. Hey, Nate, I didn't mention this, but you work for Bloomberg. Did you, do, do you have to recuse yourself if we do a story with Mike Bloomberg in it? I mean, I I did, but only because I didn't really have anything to say. Um, I mean, we you don't really hear. You didn't get a memo anything. from Mike saying, don't talk about me behind my back no. or anything like that. No, okay. No. <laughs> He'll get his $150 no, no, check later this year. <laughs> <laughs> he does seem like somebody yeah. you could trust and would be able to run the country in a, in a, in a good way because he's a technocrat and he wouldn't have let this Iowa fiasco happen. I, I have, I have no idea, but to be honest, you know, so little of that makes its way into the, you know, our London bureau, to be honest, yeah. that um, it doesn't really affect us on a, on a daily basis. Have you ever, Sorry to be have you ever boring met, about the have whole Have you thing. ever met Mike? Uh, By the I way, when I do that, I'm not talking always, about his height. But <laughs> have you ever met Mike? I haven't. I, I haven't met him. I did walk past him in our um, kind of our breakout area once in our London office and almost spilled coffee on him. Um, <laughs> That's good. But he's he's always trailed by several uh, very serious looking people with earpieces. So oh yes. Mm. You know, oh, yes. um, but he, he I, I do see him in the office from time to time over here. 
Let's take a little break, and we won't talk about politics anymore. Although it's it's really so fun to talk about. It's hard not to. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by my mattress. Man, that mattress takes a pounding. The Casper, oh, I love my Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. And I think by now everybody knows the story. Casper took a look at uh, the mattress business and said, this is ripe for, uh, for reinvention. Look at the markup mattress stores take. They double the cost of the mattress. If we could sell direct to people, why, we could save them hundreds, nay, thousands of dollars. But there was one little problem. How, people like to lie on a mattress before they buy it. That's silly because you can't really. Oh, that's nice. You can't really. <laughs> you can't really tell from lying on a mattress in a mattress store if you're going to like that when you go to bed on it. So Casper has a much better way. You get to lie on that mattress to try it for a hundred nights at any time in those first hundred nights. If it doesn't exactly fit your needs, you call them up. They'll come and get it, refund you every penny. It will cost you absolutely nothing. I have that is a I believe. The new hybrid, Casper hybrid mattress. I actually have I have multiple Casper mattresses because because I I had the original Casper, which is awesome. That combines multiple supportive memory foams for a quality sleep surface, just the right amount of sink and bounce. And as with all Casper mattresses, it's breathable. That means you sleep cool, even if you have a a cat sleeping next to you, as I often do. You're never hot in the Casper mattress. It lets you easily regulate your body temperature. 20,000 reviews, an average of 4.8 stars. That's on Casper, Amazon, Google. Casper is becoming the Internet's favorite mattress. Now they've added some new ones. There's the Wave, which features a patent-pending premium support system that mirrors the natural shape of your body. There's the Essential, a streamlined design at a price that won't keep you up at night. And the Hybrid, which combines the pressure relief of award-winning foam with durable yet gentle springs. I like the hybrid. That's the one we've got now. Because uh, I'm a I'm a big guy. And I don't know if you've noticed big guys or, or gals, but sometimes when you get out of bed, the bed gives way underneath you when you fall out of bed. The, I love the firm edge on the hybrid. Those durable springs. And they still give you the give and the support. But they also have a little bit of firmer edge, which is very nice. Actually, I just, all my Caspers, I love all my Caspers. And by the way, uh, they have plenty of other products there, like my Casper pillow, which I, if I get in bed and my Casper pillow is missing, I yell at my wife. I say, where's my pillow? I need my pillow. And the great Casper sheets. And of course, the Casper glow, that lamp that wakes you up slowly. 100 nights, risk-free sleep on a trial. You can be sure of your purchase. They also offer free shipping and painless returns in the U.S. and Canada. Casper, get a Casper mattress today. Save $100 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash twit1 and using the offer code twit1 at checkout. $100 off select mattresses by going to casper.com slash twit1 and entering the code twit1 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Thank you, Casper for supporting our programs. Thank you for supporting our programs by using that offer code and that special address. That way you let them know you saw it here. Casper.com slash twit1, promo code twit1. Where else should we go with uh, with this one? Is this, uh, this is a sign of the times. I thought this was kind of a, a little bit of a sad story. The New York Police Department, famous, you've seen it on a million crime shows, for their notebooks, their handwritten activity logs, They've been using those since the 1800s. They are going to phase them out for, uh, get this, an iPhone app. Officers will have department-issued iPhone apps, and they'll be doing all their logging in the app instead of the notebook. I feel like that's kind of, that's kind of sad. It's kind of the end of an era. Not to mention how hard it is to type on that Apple keyboard when you're chasing it. <laughs> an armed felon. Well, they'll use they'll use Siri, right? They'll just oh, that's sure. it. Yeah, oh, that'll and then, work. And then, Wonderful. And then Siri <laughs> being so accurate <laughs> will will misinterpret the evidence, and then it'll be used you, in. You bring it to court. I uh, recorded it at this time. Uh, Siri, tell me uh, what I recorded at that time. Look what I found on the internet about that. Thanks a lot, Siri. Uh, anyway. 
This sounds a lot like Makes the sense. Iowa caucus using an app. I have to, yeah. I have to say. Scary. Very. I, uh, I stopped. Uh, I stopped using uh, notebooks, paper notebooks, uh, in journalism several years ago. I just went fully digital, just all in, not a single piece of paper anymore. Really? And, um, you don't use the yeah, famous because, reporters' notebook anymore. Nope, I don't. I don't at all. We, ha I have them. I, they're there, but I never ever use them. I just, I use, um, I just either dictate things or I use. If I've got my iPad, I'll write with the Apple Pencil and when I worked and, and things like that. When I worked for a network, I was told uh, to not only use the notebook, but write everything down because that's a legal document, right? Yeah. And if yeah, somebody and we, contests you know, we, a quote or whatever, you've got it in your notebook. Absolutely, and and you would keep notebooks for for a couple of years, right. um, or, or or longer. But I've I've got every note. Yeah, I've been a reporter for for nearly fifteen years now, and I've got every note pretty much that I've certainly written in the last ten years, um, all digital, all archived. Okay, are you, what about using? I really like the feature now in the modern Android uh, Android Ten. They have a voice recorder that transcribes and does a very good job. What about that? Could you use that? I do. I don't use that specifically, but I do run um, non-sensitive interviews through uh, an AI-powered transcription service um, that doesn't it doesn't reach human people. But obviously, there's always a chance that it could. So for anything that's actually sensitive, um, that still gets that that never leaves you know my my device. This, the Google like thing, that. as I remember, the uh, new recorder is uh, is device based. So, but uh, but you're right. I mean, it, there's no. <laughs> I use dictation on um, Gboard on my iPhone, so I use the the Google keyboard and let it dictate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's it's really good. Mm. Yeah, just Nick in chat says, I guarantee you, they will all use voice memos, and I think that's probably spot on. And I think uh, also there's going to be a good, healthy number of New York police officers that still they write keep their memo down book in yep. a notebook and then yep. transfer yep. it to the app, and they have both. What you lose is, uh, as an example, this this image from the New York Times. This is <clears throat> Officer Sean McGill's memo book, the first police officer to arrive at the World Trade Center on 9/11. Oh. And uh, so that's a his that's a historic document, and mm -hmm. there is something in the written paper that cannot be replaced with the kind of antiseptic digital transcription or, or yeah. typing. I guess an audio recording might be even better, but I remember when Nicholson Baker was fighting, he's a, one, of my, one of my favorite novelists, uh, he was fighting the move, libraries all over the world are doing this, replacing their handwritten card catalogs with digital card catalogs. And he was bemoaning it because he said the, the notations, the things that are written on those cards by generations of librarians are valuable information. And you're losing it. You're throwing it away. And I, the yeah. other, I went back to my alma mater a few years ago and where there used to be these great, beautiful, gothic, cavernous rooms with giant wooden card catalogs. It felt like miles of them completely replaced by terminals. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm. and Baker says, yeah, those catalogs, they move them to a storage facility and then eventually they just destroy them. They're gone. But you know what? I mean, digital information and devices, they capture a different type of metadata. I would, I would call that almost metadata. You know, it, if, if there's yes. a main note card and somebody scrolled something down the edge or, or something like that, it's basically metadata. And devices have that kind of metadata. It might be anything from the GPS location. It could be uh, the, the, the speed a device is traveling at. You know, I think Uber uses um, a, a system now and has in the US for, for, for a little while that can detect crashes or impact if both driver and passenger cars stop at the same time. That might indicate that there's been a crash or, or an accident of some kind. And I think that if if a police department is using uh, a device, it is actually potentially capturing more than just the notes themselves mm. and the voice memos. There's a whole yeah, range of things that, either, you know, even if they're not capturing them now, they potentially could. And maybe that would be useful in solving cases down the line well and you're a, a proof uh, an example that proves it because you are very content with your digital notes now right they're every bit as good as the handwritten ones you did uh, they are yeah i mean I, I i haven't been caught out you know there are always exceptions obviously as a as a as a journalist very different to a police officer you know anytime i'm recording somebody i'm always asking them up front you know i'm never recording anyone right. even if it's just getting transcribed i always ask and sometimes it's you don't even want to put that question out there because you don't want to uh worry a, a source potentially so you you don't record anything and but then 
I have the iPad and I use the pencil almost as a body language tool. Like, look, I'm not recording. I'm writing notes. I'm taking notes. And so far, no one has ever, you know, had an issue with that because the whole relationship's built on trust anyway. Um, but it'd be interesting to see how that, how it evolves in New York. I don't think we're doing that here. Uh, somebody was asking on the radio show if he uh, should use USB chargers uh, in the airport and other places. And I said, absolutely not. NBC News has given it a name, juice jacking. And uh, they have an article, why you should avoid public phone charging stations. Uh, apparently, uh, and they're everywhere now. You know, in fact, this was the best thing in the world is the airports and everywhere started adding these Places you could plug in your phone. Wow, that's great. Well, Matt, now apparently you shouldn't uh, use those. I carry with me a USB condom. It is a device that only lets it charge or prevents data from passing through the USB port. And I guess. And how guaranteed is how guaranteed is that? I mean, I'm not a I'm not a massive security expert, but I do wonder how rigorous the testing is. Yeah, that's the one I use. The, like the port pass. Well. I don't know. It's made in China. It must be good. <laughs> <laughs> and it, the chargers I've seen, though, just you don't have any control over what they're plugging into. It's just a cord right. coming out of the wall with a lightning. Oh, oh that's, that's a what real. I would argue you is def like if you're at an airport, like, and you can't see what the cable's plugged into, don't yeah. plug your phone that's, into that. I didn't realize they're doing that. So it's not a USB port. Correct. It's a cable. Yes. Yeah. Oh, don't plug it's like free those. charging here. <laughs> like at, at, uh, at Burbank Airport, they have these. They're like uh, free charging provided by Channel 7 News or whatever. Wow, it's and, ironic because uh, Channel 7 News right here is saying don't use them. So. And it's, but yeah, it's in their cables that come out of a, a kind of a, a box. Oh, that's so you lame. Know that's terrible. There. Why would you plug in there? Just carry don't. your own wall wart and cable. It's just yeah. like there's, Bring your there's, own outlets. Plug. there's outlets around. Come on. Yeah. Well, there's not as many outlets as there are charging cables unfortunately That's, the story that accompanied uh this the video that accompanied this was pretty funny because they set up a, a, a sort of a fake charging station where they just wanted to see if people would come along and use it and they had a hacker positioned somewhere they they put it in a park and they had someone across the park who you know as the people were charging their phone they're going through their doing e-commerce transactions where they're putting in their oh, credit man. card, they're checking oh, their email, they're putting in passwords for things, and the guy is logging everything. And then they bring him over to the poor person charging and say, hey, look, <laughs> this is what we were able oh, to find out. Oh, my God. Look at this thing. This is suspicious. I mean, if I sat down in a park and there was a fast, free charging thing yep. that you just... Oh. But if you just printed out like a decal that was the city's logo. Oh, yeah, put logo, the city's logo on it, yeah. Then it's, nah, then it's most safe. Most people don't know. Like, they wouldn't know. I'm sorry to give that idea to anybody. <laughs> don't do that if you're going to start thinking about it. Don't do that. Oh, I'm sure they already thought of it. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah, I'm sure. But, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's that's it would be very difficult for someone to discern if it was something that looked relatively official. <laughs> it's not a handwritten sign that says free candy. You know this looks saying? like uh, this looks like San Diego. Is it? It's right outside the Nimitz or whatever the carrier right. is there. Mm. The ones I've seen are in ski lodges, and I think people's like security radar is at a low threshold. If you've come into a ski lodge for lunch, you're low on juice. You want to make sure you have you know your music flowing for the rest of the afternoon or whatever. And Honestly. you see these series of cables yeah. coming out wall you're gonna think oh thank goodness yeah even if, even if you know there's a risk you're gonna oh i don't care i need the power anyway yeah i'll just i'll just and i should point out that even though that in this uh instance they they had people you know they were watching what people were doing there's no reason why they couldn't just suck all the data out of your phone you know they don't have yeah. you don't have to use the phone for them to get data out of it yeah so okay that's good to know don't get juice jacked. I suppose that's going to be the better the benefit of wireless charging, right? Because that's not going yeah. to be as as possible, right? I'm sure someone will figure it out. But <laughs> well, if you can hack my Hue light bulbs, you, <laughs> you can hack anything. Uh, apparently, Hue light bulbs, which had a compromise, uh, didn't patch it quite right. 
So if you have Philips Hue light bulbs, you might want to check to make sure you've got the right, the latest firmware on it. I'm not going to read that number because it's long, but uh, mm. they 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 didn't fix it quite right. Checkpoint security uh, discovered uh, and told Hue. By the way, they told Philips in November, so the patch came out mid mid last month. And if you got the patch, who knew? First of all, that they could over the air patch your light bulbs. I didn't know that. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing. You shouldn't get light bulbs that can't be patched over the air. <laughs> <laughs> so true. What a world we live in. What an internet of things. Good truly. Lord. Does it surprise anybody that these hue bulbs are, you know, relatively compromisable? It seems like mine work when they want to work and they constantly <laughs> do the flashing at you thing. and <laughs> All the time. All the yeah. time. All the time. I uh, just, what, what exactly... I, again, I'm not a security expert either. So what exactly would the benefit be to hacking my light bulbs? <laughs> <laughs> Is it? Okay, well, you, you could turn them up. You could turn them down. You could make them red. No, the real issue. <laughs> make you, me think I have a ghost in the house. Yes. Like, yeah, yes. there you go. See, Leo, you're ha you've been hacked. What? No, the real issue is that could be a gateway into the rest of your network. To your home, to your smart. Okay, that's, yeah. see, that, that makes sense. But I just, yeah, it's just, it's like so odd to me to like have to warn people. Like if you have a hue, it might get hacked. And I, it's know. Like, I know, I know. In Mr. Okay, Robot, that, that makes sense. Hackers, hackers compromised uh, a character's entire smart home, including her light bulbs, uh, such that they then basically stole her lovely loft dwelling. <laughs> moved in, made it their headquarters. Oh, no. <laughs> she didn't want to have, have it. Yes, she thought she had a ghost or whatever, so yeah. she left. <laughs> she they gaslighted her literally. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And I just throw in, too, that my Samsung refrigerator, which I bought in 2015, for the first time since 2015, three days ago, did a software update, firmware update. First time. Thank God. Is it, is it working better now? now? I can't really tell. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have, tell me you don't have a refrigerator with the browser in the door. It can, Yes. You, wait, can you browse? No. It does little apps. So if you want to hook up, you know, your and give it your passwords for your social media accounts and things. You could Instagram from the fridge. <laughs> um, it's a Instagram. No I there this there was, and I bet you it's this refrigerator. There was a problem with the Samsung refrigerator that had an Internet Explorer browser in it and couldn't be updated. So they said you can't. They stopped. You can't use the browser in your refrigerator. This is very much like. Uh, what has been an ongoing story over the last few weeks, it started with Sonos, where uh, you, they were going to, they said, well, look, we're going to, you know, the old speakers, we're not, you're not going to be able to use them anymore after, we're not going to give you any more updates because, where, and people were upset because they thought they bought speakers. Instead, they realized they bought a computer. And that's really what's happening is, is you're seeing mm -hmm. these hardware devices that, you know, in years gone by, a speaker was a speaker, didn't need firmware updates. But now because we've put hardware and software into the speaker that you can literally have a speaker that no longer works at all in any fashion uh, after after being bricked by Sonos. Then we heard uh, this week Elon Musk's Tesla. Uh, this is a very odd story, but it's related. Uh, uh, Tesla sold through its uh, used oh, auctions yeah, I heard about a Model S. And on the sticker, the Model S... Uh, was equipped with $8,000 worth of self-driving features. The used car dealer that bought it had the sticker. Uh, they sold it on, because that's what they do, to uh, somebody named Alex. Alex bought it. He got the sticker. He thought he was getting these $8,000 worth of self-driving features. Then Tesla pushes down a firmware update that turned off the self-driving features. When asked, they said, well, Alex didn't pay for those. So they literally took eight thousand dollars of worth of value out of that car with a firmware update. Well, didn't didn't Leo? Didn't they say that it was actually originally that that the listing was incorrect and that they said you know that the original owner did not actually pay for those things? Oh, was that their excuse? I, yeah, I think so. Okay. Like it was like they, they they said they did some every now and again they do these uh, they do these checks where they they see if there's any like mistaken. Uh, at mistakenly activated uh, enhanced autopilot and full self-driving on certain cars and then they like disable ah. it. So I, I think that they said that they had done some sort of uh, some sort of check or some sort of, uh, you know, 
I don't know. They're just looking for basically like things that have been mistakenly activated. And I think I think that was their excuse. But yeah, it's ah, man, it's it it is very here's it's the, not great. Here's right? the it's not great. Here's the sticker that came from Tesla at the auction. So uh, it says, you know, enhanced autopilot, five thousand dollars, full self driving capability. That's laughable. Three thousand mm -hmm. yeah. dollars. Um, so that's Tesla's they should mistake. Give it to him. Yeah, that's their mistake. They should give it. They should activate those things on that car. Since you know the the used car dealer paid for it and Alex uh, paid for it. Yeah, yeah, Tesla said we did an audit, <clears throat> and uh, yes, as part of that audit, we removed the uh, autopilot feature. Um, so they're saying it was the original customer that didn't pay for it. Yeah. Huh. And would it would it have ever expired for the original user, or is it you know is it like eight thousand dollars worth that lasts for twenty four months or something and then and then goes away, or it, is it just ongoing like you've paid for those features so you've got them I have, forever? I have a Model Three, so I can speak to this. Uh, I so I paid. I did not pay for full self driving. I paid for enhanced autopilot, and um, and so it is it is a feature that you turn on. Like it's you can it, buy it later. Yeah, you can buy it later. It's more expensive than if you buy it at the time of purchase. Um, but uh, but you you basically add that to the price of your car, and you can roll that into the loan or or whatever what have you lease, and um, and it it is always available to you. Uh, however. I will say that uh, Tesla has sort of changed. Um, I, if if I'm not mistaken, Tesla has sort of changed the definition of what is included in full self driving and what is included in enhanced autopilot. So, like summon now is is a I think it's considered more of a full self driving feature. But it, before it was sort of a beta feature that was available with enhanced autopilot drivers. It's like it's very kind of fluid, which is weird. Um, but but the original question is like if you pay for it once it's always activated and that seems to be the case. It, and and the, my question would be is can you then if you were to sell that Model Three and let's just say you know there's a Model Four and you go and buy one of those you say well I want to move these features to this oh, new no, model. Oh no, I don't think they'd let you do that at all. <laughs> because if it's like a license thing, these things are rarely transferable anyway. Like it's mm -hmm. usually just it's for the well, person. And that's who what's going it, on. But, you think you're yeah. buying hardware, you're buying software. You're buying a computer. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's where we've got, and it's the same thing with Sonos. And that's, and it's in a way you, you could say this is the same thing with the Hue light bulb. It's why people are confused. I thought I bought a light bulb, but it's really a computer that has to be updated. Um, <laughs> I think there's my ass, the tech guy talking about that Sonos thing. I think this is the problem is, and, and by the way, I have some sympathy for software companies uh, especially iOS software companies that sell software for five dollars and are expected to support it for the rest of your life. Right. That they've got to, you know, they've got to run a business, and so I understand why companies are like Adobe and and Microsoft are moving to subscription, subscription models. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a car. <laughs> yeah. It's a car. We well, have to. I mean, that's why I didn't buy full self driving because right. you know so many people are like, "Are you going to get full self driving?" And I'm like, "California can. We can't even make appointments at the DMV. How are we going to have laws for full self driving that in whole the next full five to ten years?" Driving thing like was not. It was really a weird. I don't want to say scam, but it was a weird thing because you just kind of given a loan to Tesla, right? You're it's giving like, them money, saying like. when and if you ever get this capability, I'll get I'll it. I'll take it. But but there's no like it's yeah it's just very. You got nothing I, look, for it, I, right? I, you you were paying. It was like car. a seat license. It was the right to yeah. get it later. The right to get it later, and and if it needed hardware, which some of the older cars will need hardware upgrades, then you would get that as well. So, uh, but I mean, I love my Model Three. It's the best car I've ever owned. It's my favorite thing. I mean, someone literally tweeted me today saying they're watching us in his Model 3, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> He's watching the show in his Model 3. Um, but you, is, like, that really wrong, but is that a good idea? <laughs> well, you have to be in the car. You be in the car. So okay. he's, he says he's watching us in the car while his wife shops. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But yeah, like it's, it's, it is a great car. But, but on that same note, there are certain things where I'm just like, I just, I don't see the value in that. And I can't, I can't bring myself to pay for it. And I, you know, maybe I'll get full self-driving when we actually have 
you know, full self-driving laws that allow me to use those things fully legally on the roads. And also I just don't trust human drivers uh, a lot of the time. So I use enhanced autopilot, love autopilot. It's the best uh, in LA traffic. You can't beat it. Um, and, and, but at the end of the day, I just, uh, I can't, I, I just, I feel bad for that guy who bought the car. And I feel like if the sticker said that it was there, Tesla should make it right. And they should give this guy what was on the sticker. Regardless of whether the original yeah. owner paid for it. Well, it, the the upshot of it is bad PR for Tesla because people, whether Tesla's in the right or not, have it in their mind now that Tesla can revoke a feature at will. Right. And not, that's not a not good, good message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's take a break. Ashley Esketha is here. She is, of course, senior editor at CNET, senior producer at CNET, at Ashley Esketha on the Twitter. You figure out how to spell it. <laughs> It took me literally four or five appearances before I could pronounce it properly. Yeah. Uh, it's E-S-Q-E-D-A. E-S-Q-U-E-D-A. See? I still don't know how. All right. 2020 is going to be your year. It's going to be the year. I finally <laughs> pronounce Ashley's name properly. Uh, also with us, Denise Howell. Nice Anglo-Saxon name. I can pronounce that. DeniseHowell.info is her uh, website. Great to see you, Denise. Great to see you, too. Yeah, I miss having you around here. And uh, also with us from the UK, Nate Langson from uh, Bloomberg. He's tech editor over there, UK Tech Show. He does a podcast with literally, I think, the best podcast name ever, Tex Message, T-E-C-H apostrophe S, Tex Message. I oh, love it. I am very flattered. That's such I a good name. Thank you. It makes more sense when it's written down. And that's why the website is UKTechShow.com because I got fed up of saying oh. text message, T-E-C-H apostrophe S message. And they go, oh, right. Oh, I see. Oh, that's clever. Um, which is why the, the website is different from the show name. It's for that reason. But th but I appreciate the compliment. It's less literal than This Week in Tech, which is, I mean, it, it does what it says on the tin. Um, but uh I don't I know like why I'm it. talking. Text message. That wasn't your point. <laughs> it's what it's what we talk about on the show is text message, and I think it's a good, it's a nice pun. I like it. Thank you. Our show today is brought to you by uh, Deadpool's cell phone company, Mint Mobile. Honest to God, look at the look at the website, mintmobile.com/twit. Right there, there he is. Ryan Reynolds, he is apparently an owner of Mint Mobile. Oh, there's a lot of other reasons I love Mint Mobile besides the minty green fox. Mint Mobile is the same premium network coverage you're used to at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. They don't have stores. They don't have to worry about it. Mint Mobile is what we call an MVNO, Mobile Virtual Network Operator. If you get great T-Mobile service in your neck of the woods, you'll get the same service from Mint Mobile I pay $25 a month for Mint Mobile, and I'm getting their top-of-the-line service. With Mint Mobile, you'll stop paying for unlimited data you never use. Plans come with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes a month of 4G LTE data. The $15 a month plan is the one to start with, that three-month introductory plan. $15 a month. And every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. It is such a relief. You can port your number over which means you don't even have to change numbers. You can use your existing phone, put the SIM in. They'll mail you the SIM for free. Or you can get a phone from them. It works with any unlocked GSM-compatible device. I have to say, it is fantastic. What they're saving on retail locations, they're passing on uh, to you. I liked it so much after I did the introductory plan. I went for the the uh, 12 gigabyte a month yearly plan. I paid $300, paid for the whole year ahead of time. That means $25 a month. 12 gigabytes a month. I never go through all of that. With all the streaming, with everything I do, never get through that. Unlimited nationwide talk, unlimited text. 25 bucks. Why would you do anything else? Ditch your wireless bill. Start saving with Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan, just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. And get the plan shipped to your door for free. No, Ryan Reynolds will not deliver it to you. No. <laughs> Sorry. Mintmobile.com slash twit. Although now that I think about it, I realize... The Mint Mobile Fox looks just like Ryan Reynolds. Maybe there is there's a little resemblance there. Mintmobile.com slash twit. Thank you so much, Mint Mobile, for uh, supporting our show. And thank you for supporting it by going to that address. Mintmobile.com slash twit. Big reorg. I don't this is one of those stories that uh, doesn't is not sexy. 
But we got to talk about it because it's big news. Big reorg at Microsoft. They do this every year. Uh, this year, they took their hardware guy, chief product officer, Panos Panay. He's the guy you see. I'm sure, Ashley, you've been to a bunch of these events with Panos showing off Surface. And he's got this certain way about him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how would you describe Panos Panay? I mean... I think he's very cool. He's enthusiastic. He's, yeah, he's like, um, he really, I feel like his enthusiasm is very infectious. Some like people, when he talks about a product, I get, I, like, I get excited about it, even though I don't necessarily have a lot of Windows products or right. Microsoft products. Um, Makes I, you want like, him. You want him when he talks about him. You're just like, man, this guy's like pumped. He's, and he's just cool. Like, he seems, I've never spoken to him uh, or interviewed him, but he just seems cool. Like, it kind of reminds me of like a Craig Federighi type, like an Apple. Yeah. He's a cool guy, yeah. you know? Well, there was a rumor that Panos, <laughs> actually it was a rumor he might be going to Apple. I don't know how credible that rumor was. But there was a rumor that Panos was leaving Microsoft. And that might explain why he has gotten, what I think is kind of a promotion. He has now, he will no longer be just hardware. He's going to be software. He is now running Microsoft's OXO, their Experiences and Devices unit, which means, well, I guess that's a promotion, right? I guess so. Sounds like it. Yeah. I mean, is this one of those situations where you kind of like, kind of like leak that news in the hopes that they'll mm. like give you more stuff to do where you're like, oh, I heard a rumor that, Panos is gonna leave, like, <laughs> yeah. like actors when they when they yeah. when their reps drop a rumor that they're sure. being considered for a part in the hopes that they'll it'll push the casting director over the edge and cast them. It's a long-standing technique. It happens in every industry. Yeah. I've got a better offer. Um, the weirdest thing is, before he takes over, he won't be taking over uh, until this fall because. Next month, he and his family are going to do a semester at sea. He's going to take the summer oh. off and go, get on a boat. Okay. So I think... I what Joe B was going to do now. Huh? I thought that's what Joe B was going to do now. Oh, is that Joe B? Yeah. Oh, I'm confused. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you for correcting me, Carson Bondi. Always on top of the stories. I'm confused because honestly, is Joe B is Joe Bell. Uh, Joe Bell Fiore, who's the guy with the Beatles haircut, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, he, <laughs> and another enthusiastic Microsoft Very. partisan. He is he's currently heading the Windows Experience business. He's going to move to the office side of the house, but before he does that, he's going to see for a few months, which he did last year too, uh, and then Panos Panay. I guess he's going to go right to work. It's very confusing. Personally, he wrote, I'm very excited to lead the Windows client for Microsoft. Doesn't that sound, the Windows client for Microsoft, this sounds like a demotion for Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the Windows client. <laughs> well, kind of downplaying it, right? It's yeah. Like, I'm excited to lead Windows. This like, used to be, yeah, thing. this used to be the big yeah. product. Yeah, that was it. It's not the anymore. It's just, a, it's just a client. Uh, we will make the Windows client experience better for the entire PC ecosystem. Designing hardware and software together will enable us to do a better job on our long-term Windows bets. It is kind of interesting because for a long time it felt like Microsoft's hardware, the Surface line, which was, by the way, the first time Microsoft's ever made computers. They started that a few years ago. Uh, was kind of a hobby. It was They're nowhere anywhere near the size of the big PC manufacturers like HP, Dell, and Lenovo. Um uh, but now they're tying it to Windows. So that's my question. Is this a boost for hardware or a demotion for Windows? Nobody cares. It's it's corporate insider stuff. Well, it's a little both, right? It's like good, good. Uh, it's always good to have teams communicating with each other. And if you can do that by putting one person in charge of two different teams, this is a good thing. It's it's only going to make those vertical, vertically integrated Windows, Microsoft products better. I'll tell you what I, it looks like to me. An, uh, the continuing process of Microsoft of deprecating anything that's not Azure. 
that really the future for Microsoft is the cloud. And what Satya Nadella, its CEO, has said time and time again is, we don't care what our customers use uh, as long as it, it, they use our cloud. And, and I honestly think that that's more of this, that they're, they're really doubling down on the cloud. And that means, it's, it, to me, it's a demotion for Windows. It's saying, yeah, it's just one more thing that we do. And, and it, they used to even say, the best experience of the, of the Microsoft Cloud will be with Microsoft Prox. They don't even say that anymore. Mm. Wow. All right. Nobody cares about Windows. I don't know why I bring this up. Used to be the. I just, uh, Leo. How, how long do you think that Windows is going to be this thing that powers uh, the corporate world? It, yeah, that's a good question. Thing. Yeah. Honestly, I, I think the future is not in Windows or Mac. Yeah. It's in thin clients. Uh, that will that you know the cloud is where it's at, right? Mm -hmm. you, all your stuff is in the cloud. All your programs are running in the cloud now. We you know we went from running QuickBooks on a machine. To running QuickBooks online, and I think we're not alone. I think most corporations do that now, which means your your software isn't running on your computer; it's running in the cloud. Which means it doesn't matter whether you're using Windows, Mac, an iPad, Android doesn't matter. Gaming's it's, all moving to that too. Gaming's with Microsoft has yeah. their X Cloud, which is going to be cloud gaming. Google mm -hmm. announced Stadia. Sony which, has yeah. yeah. What does Sony call that? They bought Gaikai. What do they call it? I forget. Well, they have PlayStation Now. It's just PlayStation um, Now. Okay. Yeah, then PlayStation Now, and then uh, and then Nvidia just uh, just officially yeah. launched their GeForce their now. cloud service. Yeah, GeForce Now, which is apparently very good. I've been so, using it for um, a long time. I have an oh. Nvidia Shield, and I didn't want to buy No Man's Sky. I was playing No Man's Sky on uh, the GeForce Now. It's out of beta. That's great. It's five dollars a month. And my experience, if you have decent bandwidth, is uh, it's very easy, very good, fast. You don't, yeah. I mean, so well, that's an interesting question. Are, are they going to talk about that at E3? Is it the end of console gaming? Uh, so it's it's definitely not the end of console gaming. I think there are lots of arguments to be made for physical media. So, for example, uh, if you remember when the Xbox One was originally announced, there was this big uh, uproar about this online check that the Xbox One was going to do. Um, every 24 hours yeah. or so. Some Microsoft uh, executive soon demoted said, said it would only, you wouldn't be able to use it in a submarine. Right. <laughs> it will, and, and that made um, some very important people very mad, which is the troops who often are in places yeah. <laughs> where they would like to enjoy maybe um, some leisure time at any point uh, and, and could not do so with an Xbox One. So um, things like that. You know, there are just some people who don't have that connectivity. There are, are lots of places in America, even, uh, that don't have uh, really good internet service still, which is kind of amazing. I mean, we have a huge country, though, so it is very difficult to blanket that in uh, super fast uh, ISPs. And so um, so I think we're not quite uh, at, at consoles are dead, uh, but I do think that there there's continually going to be this push for more and more cloud, uh, more and more digital, you know, digital downloads, online gaming, uh, you know, it will also be very interesting to see if not this console generation, because they have to start working on them, uh, you know, for years prior to launch next console generation, what that looks like in the way of, uh, you know, access to games, you know, maybe it's not, maybe you don't own any games. Maybe it's just you You do something like Xbox Game Pass where it's, you know, you pay a certain amount of money. Maybe it's 60 bucks every two months as opposed to buying one $60 game every month and you get all the new releases that month or, um, you know, something like that. Like, who knows? Gaming is in a very interesting place right now, especially console gaming. So it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see how all of the kind of console wars play out, um, especially now that Microsoft is making what amounts to I mean, to me anyway, a, a mini ITX machine. You know, it's a it's, it's a little computer. So it's, it's not a really a console. It's a tiny computer. So, but would anybody um, use it for anything besides games? They, but didn't Microsoft kind of lose its way with the original Xbox One by saying, "Oh, it's a TV," div or was that the one? Uh, yeah, they kind of leaned into this. You know, it's an entertainment Set center for your box, living room. Yeah. Um, but it's I, I I am very curious how Microsoft get, separates having your own PC and having an Xbox Series X because in essence, now that they have cross purchase and cross play. So if you buy Halo on PC, you can play it 
on your Xbox and vice versa. So if you already have a PC, what is your incentive to get an Xbox? Like, I, I want to know what the answer to that question is. And I hope they answer it. And probably, you know, fingers crossed they will at, at E3. Uh, kind of in a fit turnabout is fair play. Last year, the Navy launched the USS Colorado, its newest nuclear-powered attack submarine, with Xbox controllers. So, <laughs> which just makes sense, because I bet you they get a lot of sailors who really can play a great Xbox game. Of course. Uh, well, they're really comfortable controllers. That's I'll right. I'll say that. They're, it's the first attack submarine where sailors use an Xbox controller to maneuver the photonics masts, which replaced periscopes. Other submarines have joysticks. Using commercial off-the-shelf technology saves money, and young sailors report to the submarine knowing how to use it. Yeah, I wow. mean, you just you already know how to use the you already know how to use the controller. It's inherently built into you. If you've you know if you've ever played a video game, it's like oh here's here's a controller. You know what that is. You don't have to be trained. <laughs> Pretty cool. Did anyone else just go straight to Ender's Game in their head? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, how do I destroy the enemy? Press Y X. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that's pretty. That's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's the uh, U.S. Navy's response to it. you can't use an Xbox on a submarine. <laughs> <laughs> Hold my beer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did Microsoft used to make a version of Windows XP for submarines specifically, or did I make that up? That sounds right. I'm some sure those, it was like Windows X, XP for submarines or something. Some of those submarines are probably still using Windows XP. You're probably you're not wrong. Yeah. That's probably true. By the way. What was it, last month, January 14th, Windows 7, end of life, right? Microsoft does the last patch Tuesday. They say, that's it. No more RIP. patches. We're done. One week later, turns out if you use, what was it, stretch to fit for your wallpaper, it turns black. Oh, well, okay, we'll fix that. Now there's a new one. A new Windows 7 bug's cropping up. I saw this on Reddit, a bunch of people saying, I try to shut down Windows 7. It says, you don't have permission to shut down. It puts a, <laughs> puts a, oh. puts a pop up up. You can't shut it down. No word yet if Microsoft will put out one more patch. You know, when, when, when they said the end of life for Windows 7, I said, that's okay because they've been patching it for 10 years. They pr it's probably pretty solid. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Holy cow. Don't have permission. Microsoft will never let you shut down Windows Sorry. 7. Sorry. You cannot never. shut it down. It, this, we, is a, this is 100% a 2001 Space Odyssey situation. I'm sorry. I can't I'm do sorry, that. Sorry, Dave. I can't shut down. Sorry, Dave. You should have updated. <laughs> the, people don't have people who make those, the people that make those power cables that go, you know, with the three pins, like using their old kettles and things, like they're just sitting back thinking, oh, this is great for us. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sh I don't know what to say. I guess Microsoft will fix it. I don't know. I don't know. At what point did they just go, I'm sorry, we said last update. I told you. No. Like, no. What, at what point does that happen? I'm just, I'm so curious about that. It's like we're, you were talking about with, you know, app developers and stuff. It's like you pay your, pay your money and people expect this stuff to be updated forever. And then they get mad when it gets end of life. Yeah. But at what point do they say, no, we got to draw a line here and like no more updates. Well, you could still get an update. You just have to pay for it. A lot, mm. and it and I love I love this. It it doubles every year, so it starts out a relatively reasonable amount. I can't remember what it is. It's hundreds of dollars, and then it doubles and doubles again. And as everybody knows, that means in a few years it's an infinite amount of money. Yeah. <laughs> Ching. Our show today brought to you by speaking of an infinite amount of money. It's time for another ad. Uh, actually, you know, before I do the ad, we should show the very nice little uh, small film. I know it's Academy Awards night, and I was hoping we could get this in before the awards, maybe make it eligible for something best promo for a podcast network watch. Previously on Twit. I was at the New York Times Travel Show, and someone came up to me and said, I love listening to you on Leo Laporte, and Leo Laporte makes tech sexy. Like, See, that's the problem. I got into this for the groupies, but they're all middle-aged men. Tech News Weekly 
NVIDIA is finally opening the doors to the public for its own cloud gaming service called GeForce Now. You've probably heard of it. GeForce Now, they say, not only can you try this thing for free right now for an hour at a time, pay just $5 a month to basically bring a vast collection of your existing PC games, whether you bought them on Steam, whether you bought them on Epic. Windows Weekly. As the show began this morning, big news out of Microsoft. The annual reorg has happened. Panos now is going to head up Windows and devices. And Joe B., who has been running Windows experiences on the client, is going to move to Office. Security Now. Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation has asked Microsoft, and this is a term I was not familiar with, Leo, to upcycle Windows 7 hmm. by releasing it to the public. To hoots and uh, howls of laughter. Uh, exactly. <laughs> uh -huh. We read the tech news so you don't have to. Uh, our show today brought to you by Epson, the amazing Epson EcoTank printers. Epson deserves a lot of credit. If you want to talk about courage in the tech industry, the courage to say goodbye to ink cartridges in the printer industry, that's that's unheard of. Thank goodness the Epson EcoTank printer became available all over the world. You can now kiss expensive ink cartridges goodbye. Up to two years of ink in the box. And when you go to the store in 2022 to get more ink, by the way, really nice bottles. They're, they're color-coded. They're keyed. You can't put them in the wrong uh, port. You can't spill them. They're very easy to do. And when you go to the store in 2022 to get another set, you can say to the store, hey, office supply store, I'll see you in two years. I'll see you in 2024. That's awesome. Super-sized, easy-to-fill tanks. You're never going to hassle with buying or changing ink cartridges again. It's changing the way people print. Less frustration, more time to get things done. If you're in business, more time to get more business done at home. I have two of them at home. I love them. It's great for business, great for home. Print all your business reports, your tax time's coming up. You can print your tax forms and just and not run out of ink. Do it in color, too, the beautiful color. There are a whole bunch of Epson Eco Tank printers, multifunction printers to match your needs, to match your wallet. Whenever you're thinking about printing, add the Eco Tank printer to your shopping list so you can just fill and chill. That's what Shaquille O'Neal says, fill and chill. Transform the way your home or office prints and do away with out-of-ink frustration. Go to epson.com slash ecotank.com. Leo Epson E P S O N dot com slash eco tank Leo Epson eco tank printers just fill and chill Epson exceed your vision. There were a lot of uh, companies, tech companies. Did Epson have a? I don't think they had a Super Bowl ad. Rocket Mortgage did that weird ad with Jason Momoa taking off his muscles. That kind of creeped me out. I loved it. Did you? I was, it was it well. It was really memorable, right? Yeah. So do you do you remember who the ad was for? It's for me because <laughs> Jason Momoa is in it. He's for me because Aquaman is in it. <laughs> um, there is a great YouTube video I recommend on the making of it. They show how they did it. They had a skinny guy, and they had to match his movements, and then they would use green screen and other CGI technologies to. So, because obviously Jeez. he didn't, he couldn't really take off his muscles. Is it is it similar to the way that they did um, Captain America, right? This uh, when Steve Rogers yeah. was was a little guy, right? That's pretty cool. This is, I mean, with, uh, another uh, Academy Award nominated film tonight is Irishman, in which they make Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and uh, Al Pacino look like they're in their forties when they're really in their seventies and eighties. What did you think of that? Did it do? Did it work? Did that CGI work? I didn't actually see it, but it sounds to me like they just. It was did a little deep freaky. Fakes. Well, yeah. it was deep fakes. You're right. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the other weird thing is, uh, I guess the director Martin Scorsese said the problem is the acting's in the eyes, so we can't change the eyes. So they all had old eyes and young faces, mm -hmm. which was very weird. And then the other thing that was very hard to do, and I guess they brought in movement coaches, but. You don't move the same when you're in your 80s as you did when you were in your mm. 40s. So yeah. there's, there's one scene where Robert De Niro is taking a handgun and throwing it in the bay, as one does, uh, to get rid of the evidence. And he has to go over these rocks. And you just want to leap out and say, careful, Grandpa. You're gonna, you, he just, <laughs> he's just a little, he's just, you just can tell he's not a 40-year-old guy. Yeah. I, I argue that de-aging 
if we had had it for The Godfather, we would have not had the great Robert De Niro performance that we had in Godfather 2. Well, That's all I'm saying. And remember, uh, maybe you don't remember, but I do, that in Godfather 1, uh, the studio did not want Coppola to cast Martin, uh, Marlon Brando as The Godfather because he was in his 40s. He was a young guy. Right. And they forced him to do a test sequence with uh, Brando. It was the scene where he's in the olive oil company and they're trying to convince him to, to deal drugs. And he does, says, thank you, but no thank you. And they actually shot that to prove to the studio he can look old. But that was all makeup. And yeah. that's that, actually that's an interesting point because in the old days... If you think about movies like, uh, remember uh, Dustin Hoffman, Little Big Man, where he had to become a hundred year old guy? Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it, you could tell, it's makeup. You it's tell. Ob, you makeup. Could, it's yeah. makeup. But we suspended disbelief. We go, well, yeah, it's because yeah. it's, it's really ru Dustin in his 30s wearing a lot of makeup. Uh, Too bad makeup doesn't work the other way. <laughs> Yeah, you can't de you can't de age people. What well, can you? Maybe you can. I mean, I think you could probably you could probably do which is like you you age yourself up just a little bit with makeup so that when you do the when you do oh, you go a the really other way. good makeup and good lighting, right? Like more fill lighting and stuff, it would it would look like a bigger swing than it actually was. How but long? But I, I like you know De Niro had such a great performance in Godfather Two as a young Marlon right. Brando. Right. So it's like that to me is like I I point to that every time. People go, wow, de-aging. And I'm like, mm, but... What about in Star Wars? Did uh, Do you think that... Uh, they? I don't know how they got uh, Princess Leia in the latest Star Wars. Well, well wasn't it that um, most it of those... old it, clips? If you saw the movie, it was... it. She All of her lines were very generic, where it was like, right. I can't stand to lose you again. Never <laughs> underestimate a droid. It was like, they were very non-specific <laughs> lines. And you could tell... If if you're in production, you could really tell that they wrote around a lot of that. Okay. Um, but but they did one sequence that de-aged her and Mark Hamill um, to the events of right. uh, shortly after Return of the Jedi. Was and, it believable? Um, I, it, it was okay. It wasn't great. Um, but it was also kind of like it was quick enough that it was like, okay, that was fine. But if they had used it the way that they did with uh, Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One, I... I I, I did. I would not have enjoyed that. That was really I, weird. I didn't think digital, Commander Tarkin was believable actor. at all. Very yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, it was very, yeah. very weird. That was that was from whole cloth, right? They didn't have any footage. Yeah, they and had it, a stand in, and then yeah, they just yeah. yeah. It's just very. It's very strange. Um, how long before these deep fakes? Because that's really what they are. How? Yeah, that's. How long before they're good enough that we could be fooled? Well, they're not fooling us now, right? Yeah, sometimes I think they are. They are. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I think people, just like people have that short attention span and only share a headline. If that that real quick kind of, uh, you know, real quick at a glance, oh my god, can you believe this? Like person said this thing. Like I, I think deep fakes are gonna get pretty, pretty scary soon. Nate, you you uh, you think what? Have you been fooled, Nate? I, well, I don't know. Maybe I have. And I just, <laughs> don't Good realize answer. It. That's, Maybe I that's have. That's part of the problem. Yeah. That's part of the problem. But I, I, the thing that I always interest that interests me with this is um, is actually the psychological aspect, which is a lot of the time we see things that we want to see and we want to believe. And so often I think that a deep fake only has to be good enough for somebody to believe what they're seeing is accurate. I think it's different in films because there's a, there are other elements of illusion at play there, but with um, with with politics in particular, not to go back to uh, the start of the show again, um, I think that's where it gets particularly worrying because then they don't have to be absolutely perfect for somebody who wants to believe what they're seeing is true to believe that it is true and then to spread it as if it was. Um, and for that, it doesn't need perfection. And that's why I think we're kind of already there and why it's already scary. Don't attempt too much. Use it subtly. Use it as yeah. in, in just the right place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you know what? People aren't very good. I have to, you know what? I have to agree with you because I, I, I watch videos all the time on Reddit and elsewhere where I think that must be made up. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't well, know. Deep, deep fake detection is certainly a growth industry right now. Apparently, uh, mm -hmm. Google's, uh, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, their uh, political arm has come up with uh, a thing called assembler 
that can detect modified photos. But they, but they're going to, and they're going to give it to journalists. But they're not going to give it to uh, us. Be mm. nice if we had that. Just reminds me of that really old meme. Like, this is shopped. I can tell by the pixels. <laughs> 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 but you can, right? The pixels will tell you, won't they? I guess so. I mean, yeah. No. Some, I don't know. There'll I always come a point where someone will find a way around. You know. I wanted to believe that my uh, refrigerator finally updated its firm years, firmware after five years, and the chat room pointed out to me quickly that I may have been wrong. <laughs> what? It didn't? <laughs> well, I mean, I, it certainly appears that it did, but... All they have to uh, do is put something up that says, hey, we've... Right. We've, it's updated. We fixed it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw a... Reddit, maybe, maybe, maybe. I follow. I blame you, Karsten, for following. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There's, there was on uh, Reddit. Uh, there used to be a subreddit called, yes, 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 and then one called no, no, no. But the problem with yes, 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 and no, no, no is you'd know how the video was going to end. Yes, 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 it was always going to end like wow, it worked. No, 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 it was always going to end in disaster. But <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe combines both, but cleverly eliminates any indication about which way it's going to go. <laughs> let, me I love see, it. let me see if I can find the maybe, maybe, maybe that I was looking at. I showed it to a number of people and they said, that's, that's a fake. And I thought, oh, maybe it is. I can't, I just don't know. I can't tell. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. It was, it was a, a claim to be a Russian dash cam footage of a little kid wandering into the street in the snow. Maybe you could find it, Karsten. And, uh, and getting rescued. And, I thought it was real. Do you remember that one? You think that was real? And then Lisa said, that's not real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was real? Are you sure? How do we know? How can we, be, how can we tell? All right. Well, if they can find it, I'll show it. Otherwise, you just have to look for it. Uh, it has a good ending. But again, I feel like it's a faked ending. I don't know if it's a real good ending. IBM Marriott and Mickey Mouse walk into a court. They're all going after Section 230, which is Denise Howell's favorite section. Denise, I'm so glad Everybody's you're here. Everybody's favorite section. Well, it should be. People who hate the technology. Hate, hate the Internet. Yes. Um, <laughs> Apparently, Marriott has asked Congress to... Uh, we're talking about uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. So it's a pretty old law. Disney is fighting to stop the law's spread abroad, according to the New York Times. Marriott has asked Congress to amend it. IBM has a plan to slim it down. And, of course, many members of Congress are going after Section 230. Denise is going to have to explain what Section 230 does. So Section 230 gives uh, anybody who um, enables others to publish things on their platform a, um, a safe harbor. It protects so them. That, so if you're Facebook, yes, it's, you it's can't be sued for what somebody posts on Facebook. With important limitations. And now, the, the analog for this is yeah. the phone company's not... If I make a phone call and I say I'm plotting to overthrow the government or something, the phone company's not liable for that. Correct. They're a common carrier. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that nobody disputes that. Why? Well, how could you sue the phone company for something I said on a phone call? And that was in 1996, the theory behind Section 230 is, well, these companies, we can't... If Leo has... A chat room. We can't hold him responsible for what somebody says in the chat room. Right? It, well, I mean, there were more, if you de delve into the history of the law, et cetera, it wasn't so much that um, they were trying to create a safe harbor to protect folks like Leo or Google. Um, what, they, what they wanted to do was, it, it, Section 230 was part of an act that then got uh, determined to be unconstitutional. The and CDA is unconstitutional? Yes, the Communications Decency Act uh, wanted to um, censor the internet. Oh, and uh, that that didn't fly. Uh, but what fl uh, Section Two Thirty was designed so that people would actually police their sites and um, have some um, 
engagement and ownership, uh, you know, have guidelines and user um, restrictions, et cetera, so that, so that it wouldn't be such the Wild West. Um, that's why there are limited protections and uh, we want to encourage people to be proactive about uh, managing their sites without holding them liable. And we it, yet the, uh, built into the law were a couple of important restrictions. Um, anything that is a federal crime uh, is you're not going to have any per- protection for that. So you still have to make sure that people aren't using your site to carry out federal crimes. And uh, surprise, surprise, anything that is an in, a federal intele- intellectual property violation, uh, you're not going to have protection for that. So, you know, the entertainment industry got their um, protections in there at the inception of this law. So it's it's somewhat ironic, as is pointed out in uh, this New York Times article, that Disney is one of the um, strong lobbyists uh, seeking to restrict Section 230 when really their interests are covered. You know, nobody nobody says you can go on uh, YouTube or Google or any other platform and infringe their intellectual property and uh, not let users do that and not. Yeah, we know that because we get taken actions. down on YouTube all That's the time right. for what is in fact not a violation. But That's right. But so when use. you read what what Disney is complaining about, it's more about, you know, um, terrorism and things, uh, tra- trafficking, uh, various well, of other course. things that have very loose connection to Disney's they actual always, business. That's, but yeah. that's how you do it. If you're going to if you're going to go after a law, you never say because it's bad for our business. You say, think right. of the children. It's bad. Yeah. You know, think of women and children. It's bad for them. Uh, that's how you convince people. Marriott, according to the Times, wants to make it harder for Airbnb to fight local hotel laws. <laughs> Mm-hmm. IBM wants consumer online services to, just, just to be more responsible for content on their sites. I'm, they couldn't find a real reason for IBM. I suspect it has to do with libel. But uh, as uh, people like Joe Biden has said that 230, he told the New York Times, should be revoked immediately. Uh, Lindsey Graham and Brian Schatz both have bills in Congress to uh, to increase liability. The Justice Department is conducting a review of the law how important is 230 to preserve the internet as we know it? If Facebook and Twitter, and I don't need think we need to defend Facebook and Twitter, but if Facebook and Twitter were responsible for everything posted on there, it'd be hard for them to continue to do business, but it'd be even harder for me to have to police my chat room or my or my comments. Right. That, you so know, think, about, think about defamation, which is something that is within the safe harbor. Think about how much defamation happens online. How many times somebody says something false about and and harmful about something else. If if you are Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or you mo- monitoring the Twitch chat That's rooms, everything and, on Twitter. Yes, exactly. I mean, how do you put, you know how do you operate if you're responsible? All of YouTube for, comments. It's yeah. all YouTube comments. Somebody said, and I think this is actually true. Twitter is the internet's comment section. <laughs> That's exactly what Twitter is. It's just, yeah. and it's with exactly the Extremely same level prescient. of quality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but at the same time, uh, I think I understand why people wish to regulate Twitter and Facebook. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if you can and without breaking the internet. Right. Well, uh, two years ago, there was another exception that was added legislatively to Section 230, and that was, you remember, SESTA and FOSTA? Yes. So um, now, in addition to, uh, there's no safe harbor for federal crimes, there's no safe harbor if your users are engaging in intellectual property violations, federal intellectual property violations, uh, and now there's an exception for certain sex trafficking offenses right. as well. Um, highly controversial. But you can see that there's a trend uh, in Washington to say, hey, you know, these tech giants that have made uh, these vast fortunes out, out of letting this conduct take place, they can't just sit back and um, profit off terrible things. Um, we're not going to let them do that anymore. So there's a lot of sentiment in Washington, you know, as you pointed out with Joe Biden and, and others um, to to rein that in. But um, where this all winds up, 
Leo, I, I don't know. <laughs> I and it is it, complicated because yeah. on the face of it, you would say, well, I'm not for sex trafficking. Uh, Sesta and Fosta seemed like a good idea. The upshot of it has been uh, to drive sex workers underground and make their jobs more dangerous, not less dangerous. Right. Um, I don't know if it's helped with trafficking. Um, mm. Is it? Is it, Denise? Do you think it's? Do you think it's something that needs to continually have additional carve outs based on abuse of larger platforms? Is it something that, you know, for example, we all probably read that story about that poor four year old who died of the flu because his mother was going on anti vaxxer oh, can you believe that? groups on Facebook who discouraged her from seeking medical treatment for him. Don't use um, Tamiflu. You know, It'll, it's a communist they said, conspiracy. They said, don't use that. They right. said, don't, yeah, don't and use so it. And so she I, said, no, I don't want Tamiflu. potatoes in died. his socks or whatever. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, at what, is it, is it that we continue to have the section 230 or it, and continue and carve out pieces of it and say, Hey, like, you can't have this type of misinformation or disinformation on your platform or you'll be held liable or like, is there, do you think that there is a good solution here? Like, I, I'm very curious as to your opinion, because you're, you're very well read in this well, arena. And it's also, you're an expert. She's an attorney and this is her, yeah. this is her field. And, and yeah, and I've, yeah. I've watched this law sort of go through its permutations over the years and, and the, you know, the, the way that it has been used as a shield and the way that, that others now want to make these exceptions into sort of a sword as, as this New York times article points out um, and, and wield it against the technology industry when, when they have other interests. Um, mm -hmm. And to answer your question, Ash Ashley, I think that what you've described is what we will continue to see happen because that tends to be how our lawmakers um, function, that they react to things that their constituents are concerned about in the moment. And mm -hmm. I think that's how we, we got SESTA and FOSTA wending their way. It, it was FOSTA that was actually added. Um, so that's how that happened. And I think that, yeah, you, we would probably see um, something about disinformation as another carve out. But what gives me pause is I really don't think that's necessarily a great way to legislate right. um to to go piecemeal and in a reactionary fashion um so again i think there's just there's so much concern and hand-wringing about these issues that that i i don't think that section 230 is is in a real strong secure place right now um and certainly there's a lot i think that politicians are getting a lot of capital out of talking about how we want more responsibility from these platforms um, so I, I think that you're onto something that, that we will continue to see things sort of pick away at the safe Harbor, but, but I don't necessarily like that situation. Yeah. The irony is that both, uh, I don't know if it's true. The chat room is saying both Google and Twitter are uh, in favor of limiting 230 because it protects them because the small guys can't compete because they at least have the resources. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, it's hard to win. Um, I will. We're going to take a break, and I have uh, found the. Uh, this I will ask the panel: Is this a fake or not a fake? I have found the video <laughs> from maybe, okay. maybe, maybe. You can tell me, and then I and I don't know the answer. We already have one person in the studio says it's absolutely real. I will let you all be the judge of that. But first, a word from our good friends at LinkedIn. I've always said LinkedIn is the last good social network. It's the last place you can go and not be bombarded with garbage. It's, it is a great place. If you're a professional, you got to live on LinkedIn. And if you're a business, you really ought to look at LinkedIn for your advertising. Our show today brought to you by LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. Time and place is everything, especially in marketing. But today we're bombarded, aren't we? Millions of messages a minute, not enough hours in the day. How do you get people's attention? How do you reach the influencers that are most important to your brand? There's an easy way. LinkedIn. It can help you speak to the right professionals at the right time, very efficiently. Who's on LinkedIn? 62 million decision makers. And LinkedIn marketing gives you the tools you need to get to exactly the right business leaders who are relevant to your brand. 
With LinkedIn ads, you can make sure your messages are getting through to those people. Uh, I've got an example. Rod Strother, who is Director of Digital and Social Center of Excellence with Lenovo. A quote from Rod, he said, With LinkedIn, we're seeing a lift of 17% in brand favorability. We're already looking at how we can extend this into other markets. Lenovo was able to tailor its content to enhance its engagement with its audience. And, and you know you're going to exist. It's so, it's so often the case when you... When you buy, say you buy an ad on a social network, you don't know where your the environment your ad's going to live in. With within LinkedIn, you know it's going to live in a positive, valuable environment, and it's very efficient, very affordable. Even small and medium businesses are making the most out of LinkedIn ads to get their voices heard, to get their messages resonating with the audience. LinkedIn ads drive traffic; they drive engagement. That means visits to your landing pages, registrations to events, downloads of thought leadership content. With precise targeting, small and medium-sized businesses can speak to the people who matter. You're in the right environment talking to the people who matter, and you could do it so efficiently. LinkedIn ads help small businesses get big results. You should try it for yourself. In fact, we're going to make it really easy. They're giving us a $100 ad credit to give you. Launch your first campaign at linkedin.com slash twit. You'll be amazed at how much, how efficient these buys are, how much you can get for 100 bucks. LinkedIn.com slash twit. Terms and conditions apply. We think LinkedIn is a great way to market. We use it, uh, and we think everybody, especially small businesses, should take a look. High quality, great place to be. LinkedIn marketing solutions. Go to linkedin.com slash it. Here it is. This is. I will refresh this page so we can start at the beginning here. Are you ready? Ready to? So there's a little boy. He's running in the road. This is from Russian dash cam footage. Everybody's getting out. They're all worried. Car comes up, picks the kid up by the collar and drives off. <laughs> Saves him. Fake or real? Oh, I buy that as real. Really? Gets him out of the road. It worked. It's very dangerous, by the way, folks. Do not do this. Do not do this. If you slipped and dropped the kid, <laughs> you just run right over him. I don't know. I believe everything except the kid. The kid's surprisingly colorful. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. What do you think? Real? Fake? And how would you know? What do you think, Nate? Yeah, that's. I don't think I can tell. Maybe that's... No. I don't know why it would be fake. <laughs> right. So yeah, that's my one. I don't know why it would be fake. And also, what is if it is fake? What is the passenger in that car picking up in that child's place that they replaced with a kid? Could be a small animal. Could be a loaf of bread. I, I think the thing that does make it a little more credible is at the very end when the mother comes and says, "Oh God," and grabs the kid away. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Louise, what are you doing? I just feel like it would be much more like. If this was fake, I mean, you'd make it more exciting, right? You'd put him well, but, somewhere else. But shouldn't the kid, shouldn't the guy just get out of the car and help the kid back to the sidewalk? Well, it's cold outside, Leo. Can you see? <laughs> it's very Russian. <laughs> very Russian. That guy got out. He's like, all right, what's going on here? Uh, my, here's my question. Wait, okay. So am I to understand that is, oh, he's the driver. Okay. So the driver is oh, on. Oh, is the driver right on drive. the right? No, right hand drive, I don't think, this guy, is it? Because well, this guy in the bus gets out and on on the our traditional driver's side, he is not Correct. the driver. So I assume it's right-hand drive. Oh, so yeah. maybe it's not Russia. Oh, you're so, right. He's not the boy. You're smart, Ashley. I didn't know he wasn't the driver, but you're right. Either he is not the driver or the car. He's lost control <laughs> of the vehicle. Yeah, or the car the, is just a self-driving <laughs> crappy little bus. <laughs> it's a self-driving. It is a little oh, icy. It's a feature on the I new hate, Tesla. I <laughs> paid for that. Yeah, he, if he bought it used, he paid for FSD for sure. It hasn't been deactivated yet. All right. <laughs> this happened in 2017. I don't know. It's from the We Love Russia YouTube channel. All right. How about this one? All right. You, know, you can tell, tell me. All right. If, fake or not can fake? Can you tell if this is a deep so fake this, or not? So this, I love this story. Go ahead. Show this video. This guy, Dennis Sexy, not his real name, uh, has upscaled the first, the first motion picture. You recognize it right away, Ashley. I'm impressed. I did. This scared people in the theater. They thought yeah. a real train was coming at them. Yeah, I've repeated that story many times. I think there is actually no evidence that people ran out of the theater screaming. I think they were just <laughs> astonished. I mean, I would imagine it would just be a, an incredible thing to see for the first this, time. This uh, is a very famous movie, very short movie. 
the first motion picture. Uh, I'm trying to find the details about it. I don't have it off the top it's, it's of my head. It's by the Lumiere brothers. Okay, the Lumiere brothers made this eight, when in 1890, 1910? 1896. Okay. So it's very early motion pictures of a train arriving at a station, people getting in and out. What's cool about this is somebody has upscaled this, improved it. In fact, does a great job of, of and you can see, actually keep showing, because you can see the source versus the upscaled. They do a half and half. 4K video, 60 frames a second, mm. using a computer software God, to upscale amazing. the first movie. Uh, his real name is not Dennis Sexy. It's Denise Shereev. and But I like Dennis Sexy. Uh, he took the arrival of a train at La Ciostat uh, and, and, and upscaled it. It was originally 640 by 480. I find that even hard to believe, but it is film, so I guess it could be at 20 frames a second. It was one of the first attempts at 3D film. Uh, not completely uh, believable at the time, but he used... Denis used a mix of neural networks from GigglePixel AI and a technique called depth-aware video frame interpolation to not only upscale the resolution, but increase its frame rate to 60 frames a second. That's the amazing part to me is the increasing the frame rate. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. Tripling the frame rate is just, yeah. that's, a, that's amazing. Pretty cool. This is soft. Wasn't it upscaled from an already upscaled video? Or it it was, which actually is make probably makes it harder. No, you're right. It was coming from an already upscaled digitized version of the same film. Um, people have been messing with this uh, Lumiere Brothers uh, film for a long, long Ooh, time. Oh, I want to see that color version of it. You want to see the color? A, yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah color I'll show version. you that. I'll show you that. This is the colorized uh, version, or, or as they I love say, old colorized stuff. Deoldified. <laughs> de-oldified wow yeah de-oldified oh, wow. what's kind of cool you see that to me is more impressive oh it's amazing I really love that stuff yeah 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 i mean i actually on the black and white one i prefer the old one because i feel like i'm watching something that's made at the time it was made yeah but whereas I, well, this, I, this is looks like a more. hollywood film yeah I love this gives me more. I love seeing knowing that these people are dressed in what they thought was normal clothing. <laughs> I love you could uh, never wear that in Southern California. You just die. Look straight. at that lady. Uh, mm -hmm. I just I just love the idea that uh, this is actually these are how factory workers dressed in the 1890s with petticoats and big hats with frills. Wow. And that's just wild. To me, haven't you watched Dickinson on Apple TV Plus? They all dress like this. Yeah, no. <laughs> and I know. I got this on my list. On my list. Yeah, look, there's there's Haley Steinfeld over there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, did you guys watch the uh, the new? Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> yes, I did. What I do you totally think? did. I well, I, I, let's just make sure we're talking about the same new thing. There's a lot of new stuff in the world, but you mean the new game thing on? Apple yeah, TV? it's their Silic Apple TV's version of Silicon oh, Valley. Quest. What is it? Mythic Quest it's Ravens great. something banquet. It's great. You liked I it. I, I, I love it. Yeah. But I mean, I'm a huge I'm a huge RPG nerd as well. And so for me, it's just like all these little tropes that are planted there clearly by someone who knows what they're talking about in the writing room. It's it's great. The first My episode in itself just Blizzard, sums everything like, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it he just goes, like I, Blizzard? I feel He's like, I just feel personally attacked by this show. He's like, it's funny. He's like, it's really funny, but oh my god, it's just yeah, wow. Uh, the thing great. that's really funny about it is that the even though it's not explicitly made, mentioned in the in the series, is that the game, the fictional game in the series, is obviously uh, a free to play game that's monetized by in app. Yeah, payments. they talk about loot boxes. With, they talk about loot boxes. Yeah. They talk about getting people to pay for these things, but in a way that you tend not to hear people talk about uh, in games that are paid up front and have right. optional in-app things. Right. So I think it's very much of the time um, and will probably date quite badly in the future, but it's a brilliantly written, very, very fast show. I love it. Nate, My can I ask a question? Yes. You, How you was the opportunity missed to launch that game on iOS, on iPad? Oh, I know. Apple Arcade. Well, like, maybe it's coming. Not, maybe, maybe. I, I, I mean, if well, it's popular, I guess they maybe they would consider launching it if it was a popular season. I would absolutely love it, but it's but it's kind of like it feels like a an amalgam of just 
every trope in mm-hmm. MMORPGs and free-to-play, you know, that, that, that yeah. you see in the game world. My, but they the, obviously had to make a game because a lot of the interstitials and things yeah. and the establishing shots yeah, are... I thought they might have just used, I don't know, Skyrim or something uh, to do it. But maybe Some modding, yeah, mod, modding another Truthfully, game. with Unity these days, you or the Unreal Engine, you probably could, with a minimum of effort, create those scenes. I mean, you mm-hmm. don't have to actually have gameplay. You just need cutscenes. Yeah. Or just use some yeah. kind of like machinima on a private server. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd love it. I'd never thought of that, Ashley, but you're right. They should totally have released that game. Been a game. That's the game on Apple Arcade that you should launch, right? That's like, I mean, get your yeah. corporate energy yeah. going. Let's go, people. Then they'll make a fortune on their Missing in-app purchases. Yeah. I, yeah. Did, I did enjoy the send-up of PewDiePie. There's a 14-year-old YouTuber who apparently yeah. wielded such power... <laughs> that they're all watching his for his review with on ten hooks because he can make or break a multi, hundred million dollar game. This fourteen year old who's yelling at his mom, "I'm streaming here." <laughs> <laughs> what is he? What's his name? Is Pooty Shoe or something? Pooty Shoe, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, I'm just rooting for his downfall. Oh, he's um, so horrible. Yeah, I want to see that that kid taken down. Oh, really taken down. So horrible. Um. All right. So, I don't mean to wish ill on children, of course. Uh, no, it's well, fictional. This, it's a fictional child. Um, yeah, all right, good. Well, he, did you? You haven't seen it, Ashley? Oh no, I've I've seen the I I watched the first episode of it. Yeah, I did. I only watched the first episode, but I I did. I, I had mixed feelings, but there were enough really laugh out loud moments, and there was enough, you know, of that. Oh, recognizing it that I thought, oh, that was a good inside joke. Yeah. That uh, I kind of enjoyed it. I'm not sure I like the people in it much. I'm dying to see it now. I haven't seen it. I think my refrigerator knocked my Apple TV offline. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I think you're probably right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank this panel. You guys are great. Nate is surviving uh, Storm C- Cioli, Ciara. Uh, uh, the wind is blowing. The night is It's it's pretty much a gothic horror show. In uh, in Nate World, so thank you, Nate Langston, it, for being here. It is Nate World, also <laughs> known as the, the the depths of Hertfordshire, which is where I live. The depths of Hertfordshire, that's a mm, phrase you don't yeah. hear all the time. Uh, Nate's, yes, it's true. <laughs> Nate's podcast is Text Message. You'll find it at uktechshow.com, the UK focused technology podcast, and we know it's UK focused because he spells focused wrong. Uh, <laughs> you silly Brit. Yeah, it's true. Or as he it might say, true, you, yeah. you spell it right. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nate. It's great I'm to like have it. you here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Leo. The wonderful Denise Howell. You'll find her at denisehowell.info. And I hope more on Twit than uh, ever before. We're sorry to have lost uh, your presence on triangulation and it has i'm sorry you've lost the show triangulation it's always been one of my favorite shows on the network and and i miss it well we're so if if you i think what we're going to do is just whenever we got somebody we really have to talk to we'll just we'll just resurrect it so if you've got somebody you just have to talk to just let us know and we'll we'll do an episode i think karsten emailed me that Stephen Levy's got a new book coming out, and Stephen says, I have to do it. And I'm not going to say no to Stephen Levy. So I think we're going to do triangulation specials Yay. Uh, of some kind. So let, let us know. His new book uh, sounds fascinating. I can't wait to, uh, to uh, talk to him. Are we, are we set up to do that? Yeah, do that'll know? be in March. In March. March. About three or four weeks from now. Okay. Um, yeah, that'll be... What's the name of his new book? Do you know? Off the top of your head, I don't remember. It's not out yet, I think. So we we'll have not to out just until the first week in March. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you so much, Ashley Esketha. Oh, it's, fa- it's called Facebook. Oh, it's about Facebook. Yeah. That's right. He was embedded at Mark Zuckerberg's side. This should be very interesting. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't say no to that. So yeah. So if Denise, you get somebody you really want, don't don't hesitate. We'll we'll get cool. On. Yeah, Ashley Esketha. It is so great to see you, senior producer at CNET. Motherhood has done wonders for you. I'm glad you have a gothic child. It's a it's a delight. Uh, and we, and we're just thrilled that you uh, you're here and come back again very soon. All yeah, three of thanks you. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's been it was it had been a minute, so it's nice it to, been nice a to long come back time. and hang out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we do Twit every Sunday afternoon, two thirty Pacific, five thirty Eastern, twenty two thirty UTC. That means you can watch it live if you're up at that hour. 
<laughs> which you probably are if you're in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, all you have to do is uh, go to twit.tv slash live, live audio and video made available. You can be in studio, too. We had a great studio audience visiting us from all over. Matthew's from London. Uh, from Tom is uh, from um, where? L.A. San Jose. That's right. And, uh, and also from Santa Clara. I have the cards here. I don't know why I'm trying to remember, memorize this. We've got Robert and Christina visiting. Uh, great to have you. It's Robert's 50th today. Happy birthday, Robert. Uh, if you want to Happy celebrate a special occasion, <laughs> just uh, email tickets at twit.tv. And uh, we will have uh, your server bring you a cake with a candle in it a little, la a little later on. <laughs> no. no, sorry. Uh, if you can't watch live, uh, by the way, oh wait, I should mention, if you're watching live, join the chat room, irc.twit.tv. But if you can't watch live, on-demand versions of the show are available at the website, twit.tv. We have a YouTube channel. And, of course, your best bet is subscribe. Subscribe. Uh, pick your favorite podcast app. Subscribe to the audio or the video stream. That way you'll always have it. You know, you get in the car on Monday morning, you go, what can I listen to? Oh, yes, there's a brand new Twit. We appreciate if you do that. Thank you very much for being here, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time. Another twit is in the this can. This is amazing. Doing the twit. Doing the twit. Oh, Wolfie! Wolfie! Oh, my God. We love you, Wolfie. I love his bib. It says loved. Oh. Yeah. What's in there? Oh, look at those blue eyes. Oh, we got a Oh, my smile. goodness. Hi, he smiled at us. He's a very is happy, this smiling. this first baby. podcast appearance? It is. Hold oh. hand at this. Oh, that's so <laughs> cute. I bet, I bet, Ashley, you don't let Wolfie in that room, though. There's all those figures on the shelf he would love. He doesn't come in here uh, very often. Yeah, <laughs> Today yeah. was the first time he'd ever been in this room. Yeah, so. yeah. He says, what is this? Where where did all these it, toys come from? Bye-bye. Say bye-bye. <laughs> oh, my say God. Bye -bye. Mommy, you have a room full of toys and you never told me. I know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All the cool toys, too. All the good stuff. Say bye-bye. Who's that room? baby? All right. Bye bye, bye Wolfgang. Bye bye. Bye bye, darling. Oh, what a sweetie. Oh, yeah, that's oh. sweet.